Welcome to another episode of Paddle Talk. On today's episode, we have interviews with our friend from Iceland, Christian H. That's what we call him because it's really hard to say his last name. I think it's uh, Christian Halljersen or something like that. I don't know. I probably said it wrong. And uh, we also have an interview with uh, native Okmogi, Oklahoma, Randy Kimbley. And uh, those will be great interviews. The Randy one's really fun. Longest interview we've done yet. Real emotional sometimes, a little bit in there. But it, uh, it's really cool. Randy loves to talk, and uh, he's a great storyteller. So, Also, we will talk about uh, Iceland cars and the records that they hold over there. And then we'll also talk about a uh, possible revival of the Mid-America Sand Drag series. And we'll also have everybody's one thing. This episode is brought to you by Lone Star Graphics. Lone Star Graphics custom photographic and designed event printing. That means that they take their own photos at the races that you are at and they put you on their t-shirts, photo plaques, photo prints, mouse pads, custom award plaques, license plate, 15 ounce ceramic coffee mugs, canvas pot holders, canvas bags, and they even have can canvas pillows that you can use in your living room as well. So check out Lone Star Graphics online, lonestargraphics.info. You can see their gallery. You can see their products, their event shirts, the event, the event prints that they offer. They're really cool. Gary and Michelle are great people. They've been everywhere from Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kentucky, Ohio. They're about to be at the PSTA race in Arizona, which is huge. So go support them. Check out Lone Star Graphics at lonestargraphics.info and order online and they'll ship it directly to your door that is lonestargraphics.info lone star graphics custom photo graphics and design mm -hmm. i guess i should uh introduce the panel for today alongside myself i have caleb mings from california we have john sorg from michigan we have dave applegate from south, south, carolina, south carolina south carolina yep. and damian bowers from indiana and uh, i did not introduce this man, last time he was on the show with us, but I should have. Uh, my big brother, uh, Cody Teeters, is also on here as well and not showing his face because he just moved. So, but he's here. Hey, I am trying to remember. I thought one of the Iceland guys had the sport modified record. He did point. for a short while. Christian, was that before? It was, a, it was before an actual like... street legal Jeep over there. Yes. Yeah, was that before we like made uh, the graphics? That was the four -wheel. I can't remember, but that was before the four-wheel drive class. Damien, yeah. can you throw a photo of it in the group chat so everybody else can see what Jeep we're talking about? Let's see. Maybe I can find a video of it here real quick. That wheelie that he had that one time, it was almost like uh, that yellow Jeep <laughs> that hit the back of the roll cage last year, but it just kind of did not hit the roll cage. Oh, it hit the roll cage. Hell, his helmet was in the cage. I got. A, I had a picture of that on my. Uh, I had a picture of his on my uh, other page that I got. The Dirt Sand Drag Race Events page. I had him up there on there, and he messaged me back. He said he did, that he did hit the ground. I know. I knew Christian the other guy hit the ground, but I was talking Stephenson. about the. Yeah. Stephenson, I, the one who took yeah. the picture. I was talking about the guy from Iceland with the blue jeep that we're about to show you. This that if Damien finds a picture or video or something, right, right. what is six B apparel? That's the um, cruise shirt place. company. Oh, yeah. There you go. If you look in the group chat, you can see what Jeep we're talking about that had that uh, sport modified record. That was at and the then, early inception of a sport modified. And as Damien said, it, it, uh, street legal, too. Oh, yeah. And what, what was the number on it? I can't remember off the top of my head. But I think Caleb's pulling it up on there right now, ain't he on the group chat? I just. He sent a picture of it. Yeah. Uh,. It's but yeah, um, Chris, Christian uh, Stephenson with that blue Jeep is really cool. We talked to uh, Christian H, that's what we'll call him. Uh, he has that uh, Lego altered. It's got a Lego theme paint job on the side of it. I shared it in the group chat that one time with the, like the, y'all just do it again. And they still have a dragster record as well over there. Yes. Do they? Yes. I seen a fast dragster on a video. Yeah, it's a pro charged big block Chevy dragster. Um, I'm in the album right now for the stuff, so I gotta 
find it real quick. AA Dragster, Vol, I mean, and I'm probably going to butcher this, Voller Vif, Viflison and Harry Holmgerson at mm-hmm. 119.28 mile an hour. Yep. 108.28 mile an hour. 19 point. Oh, yes. Yeah. That, that black yeah, sand it's, over there, yeah. it's got a lot of mile an hour in it. It's very loose material and um they that dragster actually was also the first car in iceland to break into the twos we made a big news about it i think it was in 2021 yeah they ran a 297.5 so still only one of two cars that have been into the twos in iceland as well and christian kind of uh surprised me with this information and you guys hear in the interview but uh he actually has the fastest pass in iceland But Correct. he just he just didn't back it up. Two eighty eight, I believe. Right, and it, it was a killer pass too. <laughs> that, the that pass was a beautiful the pass. Go- the car is gorgeous. Anybody Which guess car is it? I just put it in the group chat. The Lego altered. If you zoom in on it, it has a Lego paint job on it. it, it's got it a Lego like Avengers. A poster for the Lego movie. Yeah, Lego Avengers. Yeah. Wow, he went 288. That's impressive. Pro Charge altered that they also race on the asphalt sometimes. Yep. Same thing with That's the dragster sweet. as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, if you watch any of the videos of the dragster, you'll see that they take almost all the body off. And wrap the frame in saran wrap to keep the electronics dry and keep dirt out of them, I guess. Because I would guess that volcanic ash that they race on is really fine material. Yeah, he explained that it, it is sand, but the vol- the volcano ashes has mixed into the sand and turn it black and they just race on it. And it's it looks really it is cool. a real neat visual. They really move them. And it definitely, it seems like it's very fine sand. And obviously we, we talk a lot about the different uh, track compositions, you know, more clay, dirt, sand. It's, it's a lot harder to go quick on dry sand than it is any other material. And as far as their surface goes, it looks like it's, if it's not the most loose, fine sand, it's pretty darn close to the most that we, we typically see for a regular 300 foot track so it's those numbers are even more impressive because of that christian well, looks a lot looks a lot like lumber rivers what they have down there it's got that black look to it lumber's dirt ain't it it it's a dirt sand it's um the sand there they claim is like the casting like people will get that sand that's in that area and use it for castings hmm. okay yeah and, so it and when really it really when, it, when they water it really it just packs and it Man, it's it's a fast track. Well, this track. But when you get to the race in there and you get your vehicle back, you it, it's all over. Well, it Christian, takes a little bit more to clean, but man, is it worth it? Christian H kind of expands on how this Iceland service is still, um, it's tricky, but it's still fast at the same time. Especially when they get some water put down on it, it does mm. cut uh, some good times. And the official number for Harry and Velour, we have. You said it was a 297? I believe 297. They, I could be wrong if they may have gone quicker than that, but 297, I believe, was the first time that they they really brought to it. I think at that time, they actually took the AA Dragster record at that time until um, we had the Van Bannecoms, uh take it. Their schedule for this year, June 16th, they have rounds one and two of their racing series they do three rounds they have rounds one and two at the car days festival where they do a lot they do a lot more than sand drags they do like a car show and uh what other things do they do they do like a rally cross the sand drags i think they're bringing formula one or excuse me formula off-road to that festival as well side note formula off-road is badass it's awesome (laughs) those things are freaking sweet 
<laughs> yeah, if you guys if you guys want anything formula off road, look up a uh, WSDN contributor uh, contributor Jacob Seifelson. Yes, he does some really cool stuff on YouTube. So make sure you check yeah. up Jacob's channel. Jacob C J A K O B C on Facebook, where he also releases his content of mm -hmm. the videos that he captures of awesome. uh, motorsports uh, in Iceland. I did yes. find that record, by the way. What is it? I believe that Blue Jeep was running 379 at the time. Three, 379? It's a it's a post of our so that was that was prior to like a full like hard launch on the records too, and trust me that that was for the A Sport record. Is that correct, Damien? Yeah, because he was running a nitrous injected big block. Sorry about that for being so loud. <laughs> I was about to say it's nothing but his hand, but uh, <laughs> no, I was I was I mean a vehicle running a three seventy nine in sand drags, and it's from that picture, and I just put in the group chat. I'll put the video here real quick for you guys side note though that that is on paddles and that's a crap ton of nitrous so that's oh, not yeah. that's not his exact street setup i don't uh, care but yeah. <laughs> he, he was talking that's about so... going for the street legal record there for a time before he sold the car so Do you know iceland... if that car still is uh around in the iceland scene i haven't seen it in, i don't know if it's still around but it's still over there gotcha so does Iceland have the four wheelers, side by sides, and all that? I do they see they have some dirt bikes. I have not, I've not seen anybody ride side there yet, unless you count the Formula Off Road rigs that run there. They look about the same. Dude, his second pass, his second pass, and that awesome, and that picture's. Oh done. yeah, it, it is. Uh, quads, I think quads, snowmobile quads. I've seen yeah. full body cars on regular tires. I've seen full body cars on paddles. Watching through some of their videos are very interesting. Oh, yeah. Very unique builds. Still popular over there for their open class as well. Something you don't they, see too much more here. They, they'll have them off-road, Formula off-road cars racing the sand drag sometimes. Mm -hmm. Oh, like yeah. They'll, they'll they'll take off the paddle tires on the front and just put on some regular front tire or something like that. A lot like what Farwick does, maybe a little wider. But, like, they... They just go, you know, and there's, I don't think they take them out of four wheel drive. I wouldn't. I no, know. they run them in the four by four modified class. So let, let, let's actually talk about that, about the class structure that Iceland runs. So we've, we've alluded to like with, with Valor's uh, dragster there and then Christian, which we'll, we'll talk um, with him a little bit later. Um, they run the open class out there. That's uh, kind of what the name implies. Uh, it's run what you brung and I don't think that there's any limitations other than, you know, some safety concerns. So you'll see alters and dragsters and stuff in that class. And then they do, um, they do a modified class that basically is a two wheel drive for full body cars. And then they do um, a four wheel drive version of that as well. So each of these classes they've got for full body um, cars, they do a two wheel drive and a four wheel drive version of those and then they do uh what they call their standard class same setup two-wheel drive four-wheel drive and then um as far as what dave was asking as far as like the 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 bikes and atvs and stuff have just like a, a motorcycle class so they do they break that up into um single cylinder and then two cylinder and up and for those, as far as I've seen, it's kind of just a combination. So they run dirt bikes, street bikes, ATVs. I think I've even seen them run some snowmobiles as well. Um, which, you know, swap out um, tracks for wheels. Which on Jacob Cecil, or however you say his last name, Cecil. I'm sorry about that. But um, <laughs> he actually, along, and back about 10 years ago when we first started seeing the Iceland videos pop up, which they've been racing there a lot longer in the last 10 years. But he was popped up on Sand Drag Central, turning one of them sport bikes into a three-wheeler he was wanting to go racing with. I didn't know that. Was, that's, that's super cool, though. I mean, and they basically just, they, they run those two, two bike classes, just kind of combination with all those. Yeah, basically yeah. a modified to stock class. Well, all them diehard Gravelorama guys are looking to chops at those classes, aren't they, Damien? <laughs> In all honesty, I think it, they, they would, I mean... Plebes, eh, they it could be one sided maybe, but it could be interesting too. I mean, pretty sweet. 
I mean, I like the <laughs> I like that full bodied stuff. You know, um, I love that Vega that's over there. Yeah, oh, it stretched front end, and it it gets with it pretty decently for something that's gonna be that nose heavy. I believe, that, I believe that's Christians. I think he talked about having a car. I can't remember exactly what it is. The interview we did, um, we did on Saturday. I can't remember what car he said it was, but it was an actual like full body car, and he ran it in sand drags with foul tires and everything. I believe that was him who we're talking about in that Vega, but I I got to listen back on it to be exactly sure. So, but you'll educate yourselves on when you get to Christian's interview. Um, Anything else? One of the cars uh, that I remember seeing years ago was that old 442, that old Cutlass. Oh, that one. was a bad boy back in the day. Got the big springs jacked up in the back yeah. of the tires sticking out the back. Yeah, that was pretty cool. All right, well, let's kick it over to the interview with uh, Christian H. And uh, that interview is brought to you by, guess who? Our friends at SM Engineering, Sam McCrary. Design, build, test with SM Engineering, fluid fuel systems, dyno testing, fuel management, tune-ups, consulting, race pack and data acquisitions, wiring and mechanical services. That's SM Engineering, design, build, test. Sam McCray will get you right. SMEngineeringllc.com. Hit them up at promodsam at gmail.com, or you can give them a call, 740-361-0969. Hit them up. He held a few records, and he can do it again. Uh, SM Engineering design build test. Here is the interview with Christian H from Iceland. And we're back with a very special guest. It is Christian H. He's got a very difficult last name to say. He can probably help out, say his full name here in a second. But he is from Iceland. He has the Lego car, which is the Lego theme altered. I believe it is Pro Charge. It is very fast. Uh, he's been in the two-second range before. And Christian, thank you for coming on. If you could just start out by just doing a quick introduction about yourself and uh, telling us how to say your name also. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Christian Havleason. Um, and um, I've been like racing for about 10 years now, I guess, straight. But two last two years, were, I took, it, I took a time off. You mean ten years in sand drags or just drag racing all together? Uh, in sand drag, I've been racing like uh, since I was. Uh, I think it was oh four. I started. Oh okay, two thousand four. Yeah. Oh yeah. uh, yes, like twenty years in the sport now. Yeah. Well, that's so, awesome. Uh, yeah, two, oh four. Oh four was my first race. With the and, same uh, car. No, it was a, a Camaro 84. Oh, okay. So when you started drag yeah. racing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, it was a sand drag race. Oh, the, the okay. You, yeah. Oh, the black one. Yeah, it was blue then. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember seeing pictures of that car. I'll have to throw one up yeah. here for everybody to see. So, yeah. uh, so you started racing in 2004. How did you get interested in drag racing in the first place? So, my dad... I grew up around the sport, actually. Uh, my dad has been racing since I can remember. Uh, he started like like in in the early eighties, um, and my first memory actually racing was when he was racing a uh, Orange uh, Village uh, back in eighty five or something. Oh wow, that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, so. Um... When did you and you started racing yourself in two thousand four? How old are you right yeah. now? Yeah, I'm I'm thirty nine. You're thirty nine, and you started yeah. racing in two thousand four, and you basically yeah. been around the sport your whole life. Yeah. When did sand drags get involved in your life? 
uh, basically uh, in a, uh, at a young age. Uh, uh, so I'll give you a, a quick story. Uh, my dad, he started building, you remember the blue car, the Willis uh, car before, we had before the after that we are racing now. Okay. Uh, he built that car back in 1992. When I was uh, seven, uh, the winter before I was uh, seven and eight years old. Uh, and he took, he and his brother uh, had the four wheeler magazine, you know. They saw a picture of uh, Willis kind of a soundtrack car and just decided to build a replica, replica like we could. Just just took the picture and copied it, basically. Oh, okay. Do and, you remember what yeah. magazine that was? Uh, four wheeler. Four wheeler magazine. And you just seen the picture yeah. of the Jeep and you're like, we're going to build one just like it because that is cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically like that. And I was, uh, he, it, every every night that that winter, I took, uh, I asked my mom to drive me to the shop where they were building because I had to see if it was exactly like the picture. And I, and uh, then, then I was uh, around eight. And I followed my dad through when I was a teenager and started racing myself in 04. Long story short. That's really cool, man. That's really cool. So you guys built a Jeep that looked like just straight out of the one you see in the magazine. And you started yeah. racing it. And then when did the Altered come about? Because that Altered is very unique. Like I said, it's the, it's the Lego car, as you guys call it in Iceland. And... uh I guess that's what we got to call it now here in the States because yeah, yeah. it is, it's very unique and it's got that pro charger on there. And, uh, I'll put a picture of it on here. So everybody sees you get your tires from Mike Ellington. How, tell us how the altered came about. So, uh, in 2015, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, 2015, we built the car. Uh, basically, um, when I stopped, started racing back in 20. 2011, uh, we had the old car, and he was just how do I say it? Um, he had gone, th he had gone through a lot of things. He, my dad crashed it twice, and the second one, he uh, when he rebuilt it again, he, the chassis was just not the same, and it was really, really handful to get it to drive straight, and. After a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of everything, we just could not get the car to drive straight or stuff. Then we had the, uh, yeah, after we put the a big block 632 cubic inch engine in it. So after the season in 2014, we decided that was the last time we would use the car because it was not safe and we could not do what we wanted to do. At that time, the goal was to go to uh, drive in the three and a half second range. Okay. So, so that winter we got a, a blueprint from uh, Mark Williams for a top Oscar of Funica chassis, and we took that from, uh, blueprint and built this car. Almost uh, as fast, but we had to put a wide cage in it because we are, I'm 6'1 and kind of big guy, and a dad too. And we had the big block, and the frame rails were not just not wide enough for the dry sun pan. And so we took it, it was an 18 inch uh, hoop for the shoulder hoop, and we, and we widened it to a 22 inch. Okay. And we put, and uh, it is 125 inches, the, the, the wheel, um, sorry. No, you're okay, the wheelbase? Yeah, yeah, your wheelbase, and we, and we extended it to 135. Okay. And uh, all all the specs are up just after the blueprint from a top off company. Wow, so you basically took a top off company car, made it a little wider, a little yeah. longer. Just a little yeah. more comfortable for you. Yeah. And just, and we raced it. We started building it in October uh, in 2014. And the first race was in September 2015. 
Wow. So you got it ready in a year and yeah. Your goal when you first built it was 3.5 350 seconds. And yeah. what what did you get to? Uh that uh, that year or 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 when you the first the first race we went to 356. The first oh. race. That's awesome. And that time it was nitros 632 big chief uh and in 2016 yeah 2016 we went we we finally took the national record that we've been standing since 2007 i guess it was 325 and we did the 316 it was 317. wow with the nitrous with nitrous yeah okay and the year after that i blew it up the year after that you yeah, blew yeah, it up. That, now yeah. when you when you ran that 317 it was the 632 cubic inch motor on nitrous yeah have you seen the past when i wheelie all the 300 foot we i did i don't think i have yeah I okay it's uh it's on youtube I, okay i gotta send you oh yes yeah, send it send to me it. i'll I'll, yeah. If you send it to me, I'll add it in here, or I'll put the yeah. link in at least. Um, yeah, there is a video of it when it made that pass. It was, it was the first time anyone had done that kind of pass, just wheel it, and when it's his second gear and the second state kicked in, and you just you can see the front end drop a little and come back up. Yeah. Oh, my God. Really that's cool. awesome. Were you you were driving it, when that happened? Yeah. There was no... Also, Go ahead. Oh, sorry, and also this car is still, not, yeah, this still the only, only dragster or or after it that has an electrolytic fuel injection, EFI. Can you say that again, one more time? This is the only car here. I, I think I'm not mistaken. That is in track racing. That is a dragster or or a alterette that has an EFI. Oh really? That's yeah. interesting. So that car, that that setup that you had was the only EFI setup in Iceland yeah. at the time. And yeah, and it's still no, no, not the only EFI. Just the only truckster, the only only car that is running in sand drag or quarter mile. Or I got you. Yeah. Any dragster or altered? You're the only one. Yeah. The yeah. EFI. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's really cool. Um, I did want to talk about. I don't know if you can see it. Probably not. But this is the yeah, photo, yeah. the coolest photo in the history of sand drags, whether it's the United States, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Iceland, Dubai, wherever you're at. This is the coolest photo ever. And I'll put it on here so everybody sees it. Um, where were you when this photo was taken? And did you hit the cameraman after you crossed the finish line? No. Uh uh, this was taken in Akureyri in 2016, uh, right. and the guy who is he is the photographer. He calls him the old fat bitter guy. The uh, old what? Old fat bitter guy. Old fat nice. bitter guy. Yeah, <laughs> that's the, the, the English. If it not get gamli feiti bitter guy. <laughs> and he is an awesome, awesome photographer. In in all, he's 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 taking a lot of pictures in all kinds of old spots. Well, he took a great picture of you right there. Yeah. It's very iconic. It's very, yeah. it's it's one of a kind. It very yeah, much it, is. It's really cool. You can see the front in the three feet in the air. It is perfect. So we talked about your alder being the six hundred thirty-two cubic inches with the nitrous. You blew it up the year after you broke the record with a 300 foot wheelie and all of that. When did the Pro Charger come about? Uh, that winter, basically. We were talking about to go to a 706, me and my dad, because I, me and my dad are all, this, this is our car and we are in this together. Um, and when we put the prices down and the cost of uh, going to a bigger engine, a third, a third set of nitro, and uh, and everything that goes with it, the cost effect and the power gain was not enough, you know. And you take a projector, put it on the same cubic inch. I, I took the uh, and 
the same amount of cost, you get a like, you know, 1,000 horsepower more. It's a win-win deal. It really is. It very much is. Um, so that winter, after I blew it up, we took the cylinder head and he shipped it out to uh, to the U.S. basically to Steve Morris, and he and I and he re, repaired the heads for me. He did a, a made a custom pistons and camshaft and everything. What was his name? Steve Morris. Steve Morris. Yeah, Steve okay. Morris Race Engines. Okay, Steve Morse race engines. Yeah, and it was a kind of, uh, it was a little bit of a, you know, after we got it back, some issues we had to go run through, but in 2020, I think it was, when we got it running fairly good. 2020, okay, so what was what is your quickest pass with the setup so far? 288. 288 is that the Iceland record right now? No, I didn't back it up. You didn't back it up. What's the backup no. rules with that? Yet one percent, two percent. What is it? One yeah, percent is the same, just like you have. Oh, okay, just like the world sand drag record. Yeah, okay. I went 288, 122 miles per hour. And the pass after that, I had some ignition problem. I thought I had, I thought something was going on. I, it, Stop misfiring on the right side, then I shut it off. Uh, so I'll give you it's a lo- kind of long story. Uh, we had a week for the next race in Akureyri. This was in Hapnagerður. Um, and I took it all apart. And the only thing that was wrong was the there was a ground connector on the cylinder head for the ignition cord that fallen off. Because the week before I was testing on on the eight mile track and I was battling with some heavy tire shake, and this was the effect, uh, the aftermath of that, you know. So, uh, but I, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. The the week before we were testing it, me and my dad were we were setting the car up for eight mile for two hundred meters in on the asphalt and. We are battling some heavy tire shake. And the week before this race in Hapnafjörður, we broke the motor plate, uh, the front and the rear wing went off, uh, and the engine uh, transmission got loose from the engine. We were a lot of issues after this tire shake. And this was the only thing we got missing, was this one ground wire on the cylinder head on the right side that was for the ignition coils. So on the second pass, I was, when I was trying to back the record up, it stopped misfiring and I had to shut it off. Oh, man. That's crazy. That is crazy. Um, so, uh, so, you got... How did you get hooked up with Mike Ellington, MKE Motorsports, to get those tires that you got put on that thing? So, uh Back in, I think it was like in 2011 or 2012, there was a, before face, uh, before all the groups on Facebook and everything, he, he had a, a chat room called San, San Drag Central, I guess. Was, yep, San Drag Central, yeah. one of the uh, greatest I, uh, founding points of the sport. Yeah, and and I would I would just follow this follow this car, and I was watching all the all the uh, you know the gravel rama videos and everything was just on YouTube, just searching and searching, seeing, see, just looking for cars and just studying the sport, basically. And I saw somewhere, but just the M- MKE Motorsport, just when I was looking for tires and from that, and I just contacted him. And actually, and we came a pretty good partnership between us for quite a while. Oh, that's really cool. So you just... You found you found some videos on YouTube, and you seen MKE Motorsports on there, and you looked them up, and you gave them a call. And yeah, that's all it took. Yeah, that's, re- <laughs> that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, I said one of the founding points of the sport. It's like Sandrag Central is one of those 
it's a Facebook group and it's private, but it's really cool. It's really informative. Mike Ellington does a great job with it. Um, every bunch of for sale posts on there and just discussion board and everything like that. <clears throat> so we talked about your tires and that you got them from MKE Motorsports. Um, let's talk about the track surface that you guys race on because it's not really the norm of what we race on here in the States. Like you guys are racing on black surface. I think the anything closest to that here is probably um, Shelton's Kentucky or North Carolina, but they're dirt. Your guys is actually sand with like yeah. volcanic ashes or something in it like that. Yeah, could it, you, ex could it, you explain that to the listeners, what you guys actually race on? Uh, yeah. So, so in the beginning, we always race off the shore, basically, where it is basically black sand that is basically volcanic ashes. Yeah, after, because this island here in Iceland, this is basically a big volcano and active right now, if you follow the news. So, uh, and that's why the black sand, it's just, a, yeah, it's a volcan because of the volcano ashes. It was, I was told, I'm fine if I'm not correct, but, and our material is, yeah, it's basically pure sand and gravel, and it is really loose, not the, the heavy clayish like you have, and, and when it gets wet, it, it, then it will be heavy, gets heavy. Um, so, like how the track prep is here, it's, in the beginning, when when the the uh, the material is loose, and then it's like you are getting a, a lot of wheel spin always from the start. It's uh, in the later of the day when the when the tractors and uh, how they track uh, prep the track, they push uh, like they push the sand down to get it like like tight yeah, tight tightening the surface so it's not like you pack it down kind of yeah 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 and then it starts to get better after the, the days goes on but it's kind of uh, it's not the same basically what the track the track material is not the same in Hapnafjörður or in Akureyri it's more uh, more uh, more clay is more dusty in Akureyri, it's it's two different things. And uh, in in Hapafir, it's like it's more like um, like beach sand, basically. I, I think see. That's the best see. best word for it. I could see. It's like you're racing on the beach. And which track was that you said? In Hapafir. Hop in the, I I can't say. Yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> hop in the hop in the yeah whatever. Yeah. I have yeah. it. I have it. Hop in the fjör. Yes. Okay. I'll call it that. Um so that half of the was more like sand and then you said Akureyri was more clayish. Yeah, clayish. It's it's when it gets wet, it gets more clayish, but when it's dry, it's really loose. So there was so there was three places to race at in Ireland, but now there's only one. Is that correct? Yeah. Now it's only one. Uh so uh, it was at first we always raced in Akureyri and, and the place called Elvis. It's here on the south coast. Uh, okay. But but there you have to rely on you know the sea, the sea level. You have to it it was dependent on the sea level. So we had to go between, you know, when it's high current or low current, you know. So it was not kind of not ideal for that case, but but you can't find any place better because it's always wet, it's clay, it's heavy, it's just the perfect spot. But you have to but we just could do it in a small window. So that was not ideal when the what got bigger. But um, then was Söyða Krókur, that's in the northern shore of Iceland, near, uh, like an hour away from Akureyri. Uh, back in the day it was more popular, but in last time we raced there, it was like in 2012 or something, if I'm not correct, yeah, 2012. 
or no, 2014, sorry, was the last race there. But I don't know why, but I think it's something to do with the landowner or something. So that race was moved over to Akureyri. And, and then 2016, 2017, there is a club here in Iceland called the, uh, just the drag racing club here in Hafnafjörður, Reykjavík. Iceland, uh, where is the, uh, uh, on there, on there, and then they, they started to build a sand track track that was been in, in the works for many years, but, and was done, yeah, 2016, late 2016 was the first race. And they were, that's just like uh, 20 minutes away from where I live. So it's really convenient, you know. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you can just live 20 minutes from when you race, I'm sure it definitely, yeah, yeah, definitely helps. Yeah. Uh, and like five minutes from my shop where I have a, where I have my shop, yeah. Oh, wow. So there you just, go. Yeah, yeah. But it took a little time. It was done. Uh, the, in the first, it was just dangerous. Just Plain dangerous how they how they had the uh, the braking area, but in in time it got better and better and and now because last for last two years there has been a down spiral on in there is uh, the the racing has not been good to say it just like that and they decided. After last year, to not have any race this year, oh. I don't know why. Yeah. Oh, well, that's uh, it's... that doesn't help the sport, man. Um, no, so you get lack of numbers, it sounds like the problem may be with just like yeah. they don't want to have the race because there's not enough people signing up for these races. Yeah, that's 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 correct. Okay, well, that's definitely a problem if you are from Iceland and you're listening to this and. You want to go sand drag racing? Get out to that race in Akureyri this year and get it done. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, Christian. I wanted to ask you another question about um, some of your favorite moments from Hafnafjör. I crap. I don't know how to say it. Hafnafjör, the track yeah. you were just talking about that they don't race at anymore. Um, what are some of your favorite moments from that track, and what will you miss about it? Yeah, my favorite moment would. It's definitely when I went to 88. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. yeah. 88 at that place, right? Yeah. There. Yeah. That was just the perfect path. It's like, you know, everybody who are racing, you, when you're driving, when you, you, you just can feel it when you release the button and it's so smooth, nothing can happen. It just A to B effortless. You know, wow. it was just, you, you just passed it when you release the button, when it, Kick, click in second gear. You could just feel this was a really, really good pass. Yeah, you so, felt it. You knew, huh? Yeah, as soon as, yeah, as, soon yeah, as you got yeah. out the car, you're like, "What is it?" Yeah, because yeah, that's that's <laughs> an awesome feeling. That's an awesome yeah. feeling. Um, so um, we talked about the track surface. We talked about how awesome your car is. Um, one thing we didn't really touch on is uh, drag racing has always been popular especially anywhere that uh, takes motorsports uh, fairly seriously. Um, but when did, when did sand drags become popular in Iceland? Uh, but, uh, actually, the first race that was held here is back in 1975, if I remember correct, was a sand drag race. Really? Yeah. So there was a sand drag race before they started racing on the asphalt in Iceland? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That is great. That's fantastic. That is just that's that's amazing. Can uh enlighten us more about that after they so they had their first race in 1975 and it was a sand drag race. Yeah, the first race. Yeah, I, I so I think I'm not bullshitting too much, but yeah, I think it was 1975. And shortly after that, the the first middle club is actually the club that. That, that was was uh, responsible for it. Then the year after, I, I think they had a, a track or or a land. 
they got the land to build a new drag racing track. So sand drag racing has always been a part of the motorsport history here, basically. Well, that's that's amazing. That's great. And uh, knowing that now that Iceland's very first race was a sand drag race and that uh, the numbers are kind of dwindling down and they, um, you know, those people that are hopefully our new audience listening in Iceland, uh, get out there to those racetrack, get out there to Akureyri this year and uh, support these guys. Keep the keep the racing alive for our sport in Iceland. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, I got a few more questions for you and then I will uh, let you go. Do you want to race in another country? And if so, which one would it be and which track most specifically, if you could? So the plan was back in the day, like I always wanted to go and race at the Gravelrama event. Gravelrama? It was, that was something we were planning to do, but didn't, didn't, it just didn't uh, cost, it was a huge cost to do it. So it would, what did not happen. But I was always, I've, I've always watched that race for a couple of years uh, from when I started racing back in the sand in, uh, from 2010. Yeah. Well, that's really awesome. So that, the, the one, the one race you would go to in the United States would be gravel Rama, the very yeah. first one. That's really yeah. awesome. That's really awesome. I'm sure that there's uh a few people in Ohio just tickle pink right now too. And the people who run that track, I know they're real happy right now. Um, well, that's really cool. Um, if you got any sponsors, do you care to shout them out for everybody real quick? Uh, basically at the moment, there is nothing going on. So nothing. But... All right. Well, shout out to the yeah. shout out to your own wallet, man. I mean, yeah. keeping you guys in it, you know, <laughs> but Christian, uh, really appreciate your time today. I think you kind of let, the audience know kind of what's going on in Iceland. The car you have is very badass. And uh, those races in Akureyri this year, we're looking forward to seeing you hopefully lower that 288 and to uh, back it up this time. And uh, I know that many of us, including myself, will be looking out for that moment. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, we're back. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Christian H. It was just me and him. Uh, very informative about his life, him growing up, his influence with his dad, making him, uh, well, not really making him, but showing him the sport. Uh, finding out that the first ever race, drag race ever in Iceland in 1975 was a sand drag race, not a race on the asphalt. It's pretty sweet. So, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed that with Christian H. Let's move on to our next topic here. Our next interview is Randy Kimbley. And after the interview was done, me and John Sorg, by the way, talked to talk to somebody's got sent through. I can't ignore Cody's messages. Somebody's got a little phone or a little speaker going off or something. Anyway, I'll cut that out. Our interview with Randy Kimbley, towards the end of it, um, he mentioned something about the Mid-America series. And when we got off the interview, me and John Sword interviewed him. And uh, we got into a long discussion about the possible revival of the Mid-America series and what needed to happen. And uh, more or less, I told him the only reason why I stopped is because, you know, there was a little lack of travel <laughs> between both sides. And uh, Cody is going to talk about a good point here in a second. But the one thing I really hammered on was the, the Pro 1 cars and quads um at both tracks were different 
you go to Thunder Valley and in Pro One Cars, it was a sport light. Pro One Quads, excuse me, Pro One Quads was a Pro Light. In Atoka, it was switched. Pro One Cars would have a Pro Light and Pro One Quads would have a sport light. And it just, I didn't, I don't know. It did not look good. It confused a lot of out of state people. And uh, yeah, I just, one of, that was one of the reasons why the series came to a pause. But um, last few days, since the interview with Randy, the interview was on Sunday. Recordings we do is on Tuesday. Um, there's been more talks about the possible revival of it. And basically, there would be some changes and stuff like that. But um, more or less, um, kind of like what Mr. Sorg was saying right before we just started recording again, is that uh, it seems like both tracks kind of need something. And I don't know, maybe the series may not be it. But we got to try something, and maybe these kind of rules changes that we do would uh, inspire some traveling again, give some motivation to go back to Atoka, go back, give some motivation to go back to Thunder Valley and stuff like that. So, um, Caleb, what do you think? I I am all a four point series just across you know a couple different tracks. Um, I think it's a great way to drum up support. Um, it's a good way to get people to travel. Um, race with some different people that you don't normally race with. And, you know, like you said, Billy, I think it's just uh, making sure that it's something that benefits both tracks or, or three or four or whoever many tracks are involved. Um, I know, you know, with like Dave does the the speeders deal and that's going on a bunch of different tracks and, you know, applaud his efforts on that. And we definitely need more of that within the sport. Um, it's just going to get those rule sets and, and kind of get everything uh, situated so that's the same across the board how many classes did you how many classes did you have? so the premier classes of what they ran or i guess we ran for the mid-america series was we had top alcohol which everybody knows what top alcohol is we had top eliminator which is your 295 index our mine and cody's first year running it we added a class called unlimited atv just to give a heads up class for those faster atvs that you know maybe I always wanted to run, but they did. By the way, Isaac Dahan just joined us for this conversation as well. What's up, Isaac? Hey, and, guys. Uh, and uh, so those were like the three heads up classes, but we only had one one year of unlimited ATV, so that doesn't count. So we had top alcohol, top eliminators, the premier classes. Then we had the Pro 1 cars and quads, which was 449 and faster. There were bracket classes. And then um, Pro 2 which was 450 and slower, cars and quads. And then uh, we had juniors. And those were like the classes that were kept points-wise. And then, of course, we had kids and stuff, like the peewees and stuff as well. Um, Cody had an interesting point about the uh, payout structures that somebody asked him about before we started recording. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember who, but uh, Cody, could you expand what you were talking about before? Absolutely. So... A big thing that I noticed, and I you didn't hear about it from too many people from Missouri, but it was a problem in Oklahoma. Uh, so what would happen is, hold on, can you guys just hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Sorry about that. Cut that, Billy. So what would, how they would do it, the pay in Oklahoma, it was all guaranteed payout. The top of call, top eliminator, it was 100%. Just however, the other classes would get guaranteed this much money. You go to Missouri, it was 100% for the top eliminator, top alcohol, and then it was everything else. So what would happen is Oklahoma racers would go to Missouri, race in the class with the same amount of people, and come home with less money. And that deterred a lot of people, especially in the later years. You know, they're like, why are we driving all this way to race for less money? So. I think that was a big detriment too. Like I said, especially towards the end, I heard from a few Oklahoma racers and like the last couple races at Thunder Valley, they're like, yeah, we'll just stay home or we can drive 10 minutes to the track instead of, you know, six hours. Yeah. Nobody wants to see that happen. All right. John, you, you, have got a a question? you have a traveling series. You got to rely on that people to come and travel or the races just get fewer and fewer and you, then what do you do? Right. John, you had a question for Cody. 
Uh, he kind of covered that in the payouts. It was just more or less, uh, what can you do to come together on the payouts like that? I mean, try and go in 100% across the board? Or you talked about the guaranteed stuff. That must be all sponsored. Yeah, the I know Atoka was a lot better at getting sponsors than Thunder Valley is. Dude, uh, and I just want to give a shout out to Derek Howard, the promoter at Atoka Motorsports Park. That dude, he is really good at getting sponsors for that track. He's a Whether, hustler. It, yeah, it may not be you know, a whole lot or maybe as much as it should be, but he, he does really well with, uh, getting sponsors at racetrack. And so shout out to, uh, Derek Howard for doing what he does, but, um, that's yeah, they're happens. not easy to come by nowadays. Yeah. And that's the only way that's going to fix the payout stuff at Thunder Valley. I know that for sure. Um, yeah. And so- I think, you know, definitely with helping support a series like this, getting that incentive to travel is, is definitely paramount. And I know part of the reason, you know, with the Mid-America Series is that it was kind of traveling to each track's big race weekends. Because obviously you guys have some some normal weekends where it's just bracket racing. And, you know, these these are the, the uh, events that have top alcohol, top aluminum classes. And so that was part of the draw. The part of the draw was, you know, getting that, that guaranteed payout. And, you know, as you're saying, Billy, that is hard to come by. Um, but, you know, that definitely does help get people to come to those events so maybe and maybe that's something that both uh tracks mid america series uh, thunder valley and atoka can share some responsibility on but i think if you guys can get especially for the the bracket classes some guaranteed payout on that 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 will really help the attendance with it i, I can think. tell you guys for sure me doing the series that i'm doing i um, trying to do guaranteed payouts it is not easy getting sponsors i mean they're all for it Everyone I've talked to would love to do it. It's just mm-hmm. the way the time and the, the day is right now and the way the world is, it's just not it's not as easy as it is. You know, Grain Valley is in a fortunate spot where it is. You know, like we're just 10 minutes from Kansas City, you know, and like there we're, you know, basically just on the outskirts of it. And like, you know, we're still, it's still Metro-ish, you know, and there's plenty of opportunities for sponsors is what I'm getting at because of the area that we're in. So, um, I don't know. I just, for the series itself, I think, um, I think something can definitely be done. You know, got to find the right sponsors that want to help out and stuff like that. And, uh, go from there for sure. Because I know everybody would love that too. Cody, did you have something? Oh, just keep it consistent. Because like you said, with the light systems and then the pay structures, and it was cool. At, I think when it first started, it was literally just the big classes, top alcohol, top eliminator. So it wasn't a problem. But when the bracket classes started getting added in, you know, after doing it for years and years, and kind of like to what Dave alluded to, times are getting tougher and tougher. It's harder and harder to enjoy the sport. Everything costs a darn much. So back to the point that I was saying, when you get to the point where you're traveling further and you're getting paid less, not worth. So, um, consistency. If you're going to bring the series back, everything needs to be the same across the board or don't even bother doing it again, is what I would think. Are you guys looking at doing this possibly this year or are you guys thinking about possibly you know, next year or has it even been gotten that far yet? I'll do it this year. And this is how far we got in front for it. And Damien, don't let me forget that you have a question. Um, After we talked to Randy, and you guys were listening to the interview, after we talked to Randy, John and I were on a conversation with him for a while. And it's to the point now where we talked to Jeff. Cody, mute your phone. Um, It's to the point now where we've – I'm talking to Jeff. Jeff is on board with um, the Pro 1 light thing, Pro 1 cars being a Pro light. We can do that. Um, I don't know if it's the lack of our – car numbers being a factor in him saying yes or not, but I guess with the less numbers, there will be not as much complaint about it, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) That's not really a good thing, but um, number two, I just got to get Atoka on board with that too. You know, like the cars, they already run pro one or pro one cars. They already run a pro light. It's no big deal. Stone quads, you know, and they're low on their uh, pro one quad numbers right now too. And um, something that we've done, and as I alluded to earlier was that uh, Pro 1 cars and quads was 449 and faster. But at our regular races for Thunder Valley, Pro 1 quads is 499 and faster, 
and we get um pro one quads 499 faster with a pro light and we get about 20 22 24 bikes every race and that's pretty good numbers and uh, i was talking to derek howard on the phone yesterday and he said that they switched to that for their regular races now too they're running 499 faster because they're they're actually struggling with their pro one quad numbers we're struggling we're struggling with pro one car numbers so switching the lights doesn't really seem that big of a deal at least you would think um it just uh depends what happens and stuff uh damien question well main thing i was gonna say was how many races are you looking at going to have this year and i know it's just going to be the two tracks correct yeah i mean i would love to add more i was gonna say something about that i would love to add more um especially i think shelton's would be cool but um getting the oklahoma guys to travel nine more hours than they do already may be a little harder um I mean, it's hard enough getting the Missouri guys to even look at coming out this way, let alone the Oklahoma guys. As much as I would love to see them come out in force, and because, like, like you said, Shelton's that's a closer track to us, very good facility. It'd be wonderful to have that. And with the traveling series, and I've seen it in the past. Isaac's seen it. Sorg seen it. When I was growing up, we had Asro. That track would go out to Newtown, or that series would go Newtown, uh, Bon Terre, Michigan. Um, Norwalk, oh. Ohio, you name it, they went there. If Bonatero was still open, that would be that was going to be the original finale track, but obviously, that was the year they switched to being an eighth mile asphalt facility. So, we ended up not the series ended up not traveling like it was going to. We ended up only having one really out of town, I would say, race because we started at Cleves, went to Shelton's, went to Brookville, and then originally. We were going to go down to Bonterre for the finale, and that was when they announced they were sold and going pavement racing. A quick little history lesson about Bonterre for you ladies and gentlemen real quick. But yeah, I would love to add another track. I was actually talking to Derek yesterday as well about this track in Ferris, Texas that was running some smaller type events last year with some no-bar bikes, very... uh popular for the puerto rican crowd if the puerto rican guys listen to us uh, it was in ferris texas right across the street from t- uh, texas motorplex and uh i believe brad civils and john acker shout out to team texas they went down there and um they ran at the track they just said their uh shutdown area just needed to be a little longer and they didn't run their blower cars or john and john acker didn't run his blower car but i know brad ran his car i believe he's he ran his car because i know his son ran his bike there and they said that it needed more shutdown area for the cars. So I've been trying to get a hold of this guy that runs it, but I haven't heard nothing back. So I don't know. But to answer your question, Damien, um, it would either be three or four races, depending, um, but more more than likely actually three, like one at Thunder Valley or two at Atoka, or it could even just be two with one at each track. It just it just depends. And um, who says this series? You know, the whole thing, once again, it could just be top alcohol and top eliminator. Who knows? So what I was going to say that what I remember what I was going to say is that um, Pro One Quads, if Mid-America Series comes back, yes, or go ahead, Kelly. Nope. When, when you're finished with your five. Okay. Pro One Quads uh, is, uh, if we when we bring it back, if it gets brought back, I should say, uh, Pro One Quads is going to be 499 and faster instead of 449 and faster. If the Mid America series gets brought back, four ninety nine and faster for uh, quads, Pro One quads, but the cars will stay the same at four forty nine and faster for Pro One. Caleb, yeah, I I just I think all the talks with it uh, is great, and like you're saying, it'd be awesome to add another facility. I think if it's something like that Ferris Texas one, I think it's something that that there needs to be a non um, Mid America race there where it's kind of like a, a testing grounds for it. Um, if it is, you know, the series is brought back in any capacity, I think the biggest things is that, um, like you said, the the classes, both the lights and the ET breaks, those need to be consistent. You guys need to know which classes are going to be in, in the series. If it is just top alcohol, top eliminator, or if you're including all the bracket stuff and the kids, um, and 
I, I really think that it just, I, I'm a believer in, you know, holding back, making sure that all your ducks in a, are in a row. Because the last thing you want to do is, is try to bring this back too soon when they aren't quite lined up yet. You don't quite have the support and the plan and things kind of falter and fall through. So that's that's just kind of what I'm hoping to see out of it. Because I think that the the whole Mid America series is, is a cool deal. It just, you know, needs to be brought back in in a new light and running strong right from the get-go. One thing... Go ahead. One thing I do know, and this is something I've seen brought up recently. Well, I've seen it brought up over the summer when we had that incident with Jordan Hyman up here. Um, in Texas, some tracks, their insurance companies won't even allow you to run a wheelie bar. What? what? I'm not joking. Huh? They're, some of their they're involved tracks, in too many mud drags, that's for sure. What? <laughs> I see Billy just kind of how short does, how, does, again. how does wait I don't they don't want you mainly to because they don't maintain the tracks near as much as my end thought you think about what happens when a wheelie bar hits a rut think about when we went to San Antonio Billy uh, with uh, oh. the San Antonio mud drags out there yeah uh, you know and I, I can see that a lot of oh, there's a big mud dirt drag uh, crowd in Texas and so they're not prepping the track you know every and couple of pairs of vehicles they're letting unfortunately, a lot and... of insurance companies don't see the difference between mud and sand yep 100 percent. and even even if it is the same facility even you know they obviously can prep it differently but they're thinking solely on the hey we're gonna just wet this down and and let the ruts form and yeah that, as you're saying damien like wheelie bars can be dangerous in that because then you're skipping across different ruts you know, so that 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 makes sense. It sucks. Uh, I would hope that what if there is a facility that could be part of the Mid America series, that it would be something that their insurance company would work with it, show them enough of the, you know, the the videos of these other facilities and stuff of how it actually works, and show them that <laughs> when you're on a properly prepped sand drag facility, uh, it's it's definitely more dangerous to not run a wheelie bar than oh, it yeah. is to run a wheelie bar. <laughs> Well, thankfully, at uh, Thunder Valley and Atoka, you can run a wheelie bar. And uh, <laughs> I don't know about Ferris. I'm sure you can though. But I would like to. I've add seen Ferris, I've seen bar bikes there on that. I would like to. I would like to add Ferris, Texas. Um, I would we, love to see that because you guys definitely have a large Texas contingent that comes to Atoka and Missouri, yeah. and you could possibly expand that if you guys can get to travel down there. And I got yeah. Uh, shout out to John Acker for getting all the Texas folk to travel. To I Atoka. I got I got to bring something up here, Billy. This was a uh, one of the the last years of the Mid America series. I'm there was talk uh, of maybe talking to Mr. Jeff Gio, uh, Northeast Louisiana Sandrags and Gilbert uh, of adding them um to a car race. So yeah. what about the possibility of doing? I know that's pretty far for the the Oklahoma crowd. But you know, a lot of them come down there for the bike stuff, and that's I mean, a fantastic it's like, facility. It's like nine hours for us, Cody, right, to get to Gilbert. Well, nine ten hours, yeah. Yeah, so it may be closer for them Oklahoma guys than us. How, how far is it to to uh, Shelton's from you for you guys, Cody and Billy? Uh, from Cody's house, it'd be like uh, nine hours, just under nine hours. Okay. The reason I'm saying that is uh, Alyssa and Devin, who own Little Sandy, we've been doing a lot of talking, and we are going to do a truck race there this year, a couple of them. So that might be another option for you. Is that's what two hours farther, maybe, maybe. Wait, which track, Little Sandy? Little Sandy, yeah. Uh, maybe I don't know. We'll have to see because, as I was saying earlier, the Oklahoma guys, it's harder for them to go nine hours further to anywhere else past uh kansas city really so but i don't know i mean uh a lot of things to think about a lot of things to do i mean it's already different because we changed the top alcohol entry fee from 200 dollars to 500 dollars. so that's cool um i can't think of anything else cody you i agree with, i agree with caleb though obviously there's a figure out and once you guys get all the t's crossed and the i's dotted let it rip you know what i mean yeah that's the even the series that I'm doing, I miss some things and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm learning as well. And it, it does not, you know, it definitely takes some time to figure it out. 
Yeah, you got both tracks on board. You might as well do what you can with it and uh, do your best with it. Yeah. yeah. I, I gotta get a Imagine phone, having so. six. That's what I'm dealing with is six different <laughs> tracks. It's been a blast. Let me tell Man, you. That would be <laughs> sweet, though. I mean, I would love to have six different tracks. I wish. <laughs> I wish there was a track. Literally, I wish the track here in Topeka, Kansas, because it's the perfect spot. It really is. It's a motorsports town, and it, well, it, it was, was a motorsports town. It it, it, it was, uh, boom. No, it, it's it still <laughs> is. They just raced down Topeka Boulevard. Still, you know. It's <laughs> so we're uh, Cody. You got anything else before we cut it to Randy Kimberly? Uh, just touching on kind of like what Damian said. We see a lot more Texas guys in Atoka. Like, we'll see, you know, John and um, the Shulls and those guys at our track. But as far as, like, non-regulars, they only show up in Atoka. So if we could get a presence down in uh, Texas, it could do wonders. But that's, you know, best-case scenario, of course. But what's nice about Acker is that he gets those mud racing guys to go and try the 300-foot sand drags in Atoka. And then sometimes he gets them to travel a little further up to uh, Thunder Valley where, I mean, just to even get to Thunder Valley for him, I think he said it's like 16 hour drive, something like that. So it's, it's we appreciate John Acker. Shout, Shout out, to out to John. He is a committed racer, sand and mud. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cody, you want to tell, you want to tell that story about John Acker at the mud race? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he likes to do this thing when he comes to the sand drags. Anytime the tech team Texas does well, he'll always be like, that's not bad for a couple mud racers. And when we was down there to Texas for the mud race that we covered, he it's won Antonio. like the, three, the 330 index. I think John won. He comes over to Billy and I, he goes, it ain't too bad for a couple sand draggers, huh? <laughs> so he's got a sense of humor too. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Acker is awesome. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy this Randy Kimberly interview. Um, some emotion in there. He's a great storyteller. I could literally, we could that interview could have lasted two hours. Me and John could sat there and just listen to everything that he was saying. He's just so easy to listen to, and uh, he just lets it flow. And uh, the emotion he shows for uh, his son Troy is true and passionate. And uh, when you see the wall behind him, it, it sh truly shows that uh, he is no slouch in this sport that we all um, now. Admire. How many stories about his paddle tires being backwards? No, right. that's, a, that's that's a real thing. If you ever got too much hook, you turn those tires around backwards. Yeah, you do. That's a real thing. That's a real thing. We'll get into a different episode. Uh, we're going to cut it over to uh, the interview that me and John Sorg did with Randy Kimberly. But before we do that, give a shout out to Lone Star Graphics, your uh, number one place for custom photo, graphic, and design on site event printing. That means they're going to be at the track that you're at taking your picture while you're racing, and then you can go to their trailer and get that photo, put on a t-shirt, some photo plaques, some photo prints, a mouse pad even, some custom award plaques, license plates, excuse me, license plates, ceramic mugs, canvas pot holders, canvas bags, and even custom pillows. They got more on their website. Go check it out. You go to their website, lonestargraphics.info, you can check out their gallery. You can check out their products, their event shirts, the event prints. Their gallery goes all the way back to 2006 when the top fuelers were still running. And Jeff Gio was, uh, I don't think it was that far ago, but Jeff Gio was getting going on that wild thing. And they got pictures of all of that. So go back, check out their gallery. You can order on their website. They'll ship it to your door. LoneStarGraphics.info. Lone Star Graphics, custom photo graphics and design. Once again, that's LoneStarGraphics.info. Now, here is Randy Kimberly. We are back with a very special guest. He's Randy Kimberly, multi-time Atoka Motorsports Park track champion. We're going to get to a little bit of that, a little bit about his cars, a little bit, a little bit about his sand drag racing life. And uh, we'll start with this. Uh, Randy, just... Real quick for everybody, uh, could you please give yourself a quick introduction to our listeners? Well, my name's Randy Kibley. I uh, sand drag about everything on wheels. Uh, started in 2005, and uh, I own RNS Collegiate Center in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. It pretty much sponsors all this racing that I do. And uh, I've, I've, I've had uh, 
grudge races about everybody out there. I, I, we, we've been friends. We've been enemies. We've been everything in between. <laughs> That's so. really cool. Uh, when Let's get right into it. When did you actually start racing, and when did sand drags come about? So if you want to know when I started racing, well, sporting on professional or just freaking for fun, I mean, my dad took me to the racetrack every week. He, he drove a, a, a modified stock in California when I was a kid. And uh, so every, every Saturday night, I was at the racetrack. Uh, kind of grew up in that deal all over the place. And then uh, I raced uh, MX for, I don't know, three or four years in California when I was a kid, which that didn't happen once we moved from there. But nothing like that. We'll come back, come back to the East, you know. So, well, I went from that. I started, uh, I started, but when I guess I was 15, I started uh, a street stock class in uh, Bells, Oklahoma, or excuse me, Bells, Texas at, at a racetrack up there. And I did that for a couple of years. But the problem with, with uh, freaking racing on the, on the dirt, if you're leading and I'm in second, I'm just going to run you over to get to first and then we're going to be fighting afterwards. So that wasn't a real good deal. <laughs> <laughs> And I graduated from mini sprints, I mean, to from uh, street stocks, went to mini sprints at a few different racetracks. The same thing with there. It was just fighting every weekend. Pretty soon it was your five, you and me and your five guys and my five guys. And anyway, it didn't work out. So I was like, you know, I got to do something different. So I just kind of quit racing. And then in 92, I went to street racing. And if you look at my Facebook page, there, there's, a, there's a back in there somewhere, there's a picture of the old tea bucket I run. And that tea bucket made 1,100 horsepower back in the day. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> and I run two, I run a nitrous system and a plate system of nitrous on there, which people didn't even know what that was back in 92. I mean, they call it kits now back then. I just call it two sets of nitrous, you know, but anyway, so I had over a hundred street racing that and I never lost one, which was wow. a pretty good feat back in the day, but I had a fast car. Sure. Anyway, I quit that. And I said, I'm done racing net. I'm through. I can't do it. The kids were getting bigger and, 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 you know, just other things going on in my life. So I quit racing and then, I moved to Oklahoma in 2000 and met Nick Allen in 2001. And he just said, come go to the race. With me. Come go to the race. I said, Man, I, I can't race. I said, there's something wrong with my brain. If I start racing, I'm not just going to race. I'm going to race every, you know, if second place is just the first loser. Okay. That's me. It's it's first loser. I, that's all it's ever going to be. All right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so, so anyway, finally one day in 2005, he took me to freaking the Topa Sand Drags. And I rode one of his bikes and it's history. The next week <laughs> on eBay, I bought an old, big old brown freaking uh, bike with a 535 on it. It was in New York. I sent one of my kin folks after it in New York. They brought it back, and I started racing. And I wasn't very good at it because it was a whole new ball game. It took me a while to get used to it. And I also, you know, when I started racing, I, it was all about the kids. Too, I, I, I didn't just buy me a, a drag bike. I bought them before we were, and they started racing. The whole family raced, all the kids and everybody. So anyway, we, we, we race and, and if something would happen and they, their bikes would break, so we just had quads back at the end and I just get off my bike and let them race my bike, whatever the deal was about the family. So, you know, and that's the way I was for quite a few years. Well, I don't know how many people know this, but in 2010, actually 2007, my freaking, uh, my freaking shop burnt down and we lost 14 drag bikes. Everything oh, wow. we owned burnt up. Ooh. So Anyway, I wasn't even going to get back into sand drags, but, you know, the, the powers that be, the first race come along, which was shot burnt down the 22nd of January, 23rd of January, 2007. And I didn't have a jet at bike one, but when March came, we had we had bikes. So they, they wasn't pretty and they wasn't nice. I went to to, to a Sepulpa insurance pool up here in, in Sepulpa, and I bought a freaking uh, 350 Bruin. And them girls, they all shared that 350 Bruin, okay? And it, it was a theft recovered, and, and I had the toggle switch, toggle switch, someone stole it, took the key, and anyway, so I put a toggle switch on it, and them girls drove that. And then I, I found up in Michigan, there was this, uh, there was a bike for sale on eBay, and I give like, I don't know, 2200 bucks for it. It was a Pro One bike with a, with a, uh, what do you, uh, snowmobile engine on it, and it had a little long three wheeler deal that pulled it around with, came with it. So Troy, the youngest boy, he raced that little one, 185 little three wheeler. And then I raced that 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 Pro One bike. So anyway, we go on. You know, I I, th I thought that shot was the worst day of my life. And in 2010, Troy got killed. And when Troy got killed, uh, you know, that was a tough tough day. So the next weekend, the next weekend after he, after he got killed, matter of fact, the whole track pretty much came to his funeral. Go ahead, excuse me, but 
It's just the way it is. <laughs> it's been 14 years of steel rough. But anyway, so he had a little Pro 3 bike that he had, had built this crazy wheelie bar. So it stood this great old big wheelie. It was about three foot off the ground, this little bitty stock TRX 700 XX. And I would have never raced Pro 3, not ever. But, you know, I, I, I have the picture on the wall over there. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go get me a picture. I'm going to get me a picture of me on that bike riding with me so I can put it beside Troy's. Hang on. You're good, brother. It's tough to lose a kid. So, <clears throat> then before Troy died, I, I, thought it was, I thought it was wrong for a man to die, but I or not to die for a man to cry, but I sure found out different. There ain't nothing wrong with it. It's all good. So, anyway, I got me the next the next – Next month, I took Troy's bike and I went out there, and I won. I won the trophy class and I won the money class on Troy's Pro One bike. I mean, excuse me, Pro Three bike. Wow. And so that was kind of the start of the beginning of the end. I I, I raced it for several years. Uh, I mean, so that's how I got racing. That's probably a little bit more more information than you want to know. But no, man. Uh, it, I mean, this is your passion, and this you yeah. show it right there. You know, and uh, is that Troy on the wall behind? That you? is that is me and Troy. That is he is. On, I don't know if you see the bike. But, you know, I can't really see the bike, but I think he was like eleven years old there, and that's a bike I little uh, a little uh, Pro Two bike I bought him. We went to this this track that was called Wolf up here in Oklahoma, and it was just a little grass track out in the middle of nowhere. Where they had no lights. They just had arm props. And that was the first time he'd ever rode a fast bike. I mean, so the first couple pass I rode with him. Wow. So anyway, that's that that's what that dude was. Well, that we can see your passion for it and uh we definitely feel for you when it comes to Troy. I mean, uh maybe not totally understand, but we can totally feel for you and we're always there for you. Um uh we love you, plain and simple. We <laughs> always love you. Um for those, uh, John Sorg is also here with us, and he's going to help me out with this interview here. I think uh, John has a couple questions about your points championships with Atopia. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, man. Randy, how many do you have? I mean, I, I looking at the wall behind you, this says <laughs> a lot, really. So I uh, I have uh, 13 point championships at Atoka, and I have four Mid-America Sand Drag championships. Wow. So I kind of wrote those down. Uh in 2012, I won my first championship. Now, the reason I started racing in 2005 and I never won a points championship before that, I mean, I got second a few times and some thirds, and I did a lot of top fives. But the big deal was about the family. And so everything I did was I was racing. I was racing, and, and family came along. You know, I was making sure they was, in, they was running their class, so their bikes were top shape, shape. They could do whatever they want to. And if something happened to somebody, they could ride my bike, Okay. So I wasn't focused on me to win a championship. I was focused on me to have fun. I won a few races. I had a lot of fun. I mean, so we go into 2010, Troy got killed, and I rode his bike. And, I, and I, something I didn't tell you all, goes but about riding his bike that year. That first weekend I rode his bike, I won both things, and, and the whole place gave me a standing ovation. It was really, really cool. Wow. I mean, it was really special. That's and so neat. anyway, so after that, I just rode his bike from then on, and his bike run – Right on the five second mark, so so I could run actually run a little faster. I'm, I'm like five nineties, but I could I could sandbag as some people call it. And I raced pro two and pro three for the for from quite a few years. And so in 2012, 2011, I had a surgery and I didn't race all the races that year. But anyway, so actually got focused on me because at that time it was just me and my ex wife. We was you know that was the only people racing then. Cause the, the oldest girl, she went, she went off to college and everybody else was just gone. So anyway, uh, so if you back, so 2012, I won a pro two and pro three championship. And then the 2013, I won a pro one and a pro three, uh, championship. Uh, also won a mid American pro one quad championship 2013. Now something else that happened, I got a, I got a picture of it right here. And I'm going to pull it out of the wall to show you. It's really cool. If y'all can, can y'all see that? Yeah. Yeah. So this right here, this was in, uh, this was in the fall fest of 2012, 2013, excuse me, in 2013. So if you read this, this was a special day for me. This, everybody racing the sand drags, I don't know. I, I think Atoka is the hardest place to win, win on the quads there is. It's just super, super competitive, especially pro one quads. And so 
at that t- that day, I won the I won the in, in the money the money class at the at the fall fest. I won pro one, pro two, and pro three quads, all three classes, which was which was pretty cool because that ain't done a lot. You know, most people only race in all three of them, and then to win all three of them, it was one of the few times I did that. But that's the first time; it was pretty special. The first race in that race, when I when I freaking I, I know I drifted off that the point champs, but I'll get right back there in a minute. It's all but good. But the first the first race. In that that race, I went. I dumped the clutch and it broke the chain. that went about ten foot. Now, most people don't know this about me, but I smoked from second grade till two thousand seven, and I smoked ten packs of cigarettes the last the last three or last ten years. I smoked, so I smoked I smoked a carton of cigarettes every three days. Well, when I won that race, <laughs> uh, all right when I when I broke that chain, I watched the other guy and he never looked back. He had his head down. And he just flew through the end. And like four people before him. Had, had broke out, someone in the race. I was like, man, he might have broke out. So I jumped off. I got that chain wrapped up around this whip around. I start pushing that thing around down. And I pushed it across the end, and I won that race and wound up winning all three, three, all three deals that day. And it's like, and the guy that I beat, he's like, man, he was only going two mile an hour and he went across the speed off across the finish line. I said, dude, that's all I could push the time I got down there. <laughs> I didn't have no air left. So anyway, <laughs> so that was 13. Then at 14, I, uh, I won the Pro 1 and Pro 2 quads at Atoka. In 15, I won the Pro 3. 16, I won the 2 and 3. 17, I won the 2 and 3. And then in 18, I, I didn't win nothing. It was just one of those years, you know. You can't win them all. That's what I always say, you know. Uh, then in 19, so in the Mid-America Sand Drag Series, I won the Top Eliminator and the Top Alcohol Championship. So I started racing Top Eliminator. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I started racing Top Eliminator in 2017. Uh, and I started racing top alcohol in 2018. So then in 2020, I won the top alcohol championship. And in 21, so all y'all know, I I, I got a divorce there in, in 19. And then in 21, me and Christy, uh, or in 2020, uh, uh, later on, me and me and her, Christy got married. Well, so in tw- in in 20 when when before we got married in 19, we we was dating that summer, middle part of that summer, she won the race. So now she ain't never raced nothing in her life. I mean, nothing. She didn't like going fast. I drive 90. She's screaming, throwing a fit, you know, but anyway, so anyway, she starts, uh, she starts racing in, in, uh, in 20, in, in 2019, it was three laces races left that year. I bought this little snowmobile dragster that run, that run, uh, I think around 58 mile an hour. Anyway, she got in that thing and in, in three races, she won one of those events which I thought was pretty cool because she never raced nothing. Okay. Yeah. And then she said, you know, I want to, I want a, uh, I want a, a, a pro one bike. And I said, you think you're ready for a pro one bikes? We got married January of, 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 of 2020. And she said, yeah, she said, I want to race a, 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 a pro one I want to, I want to race a, a, a pro one bike. So anyway, I, I, uh, I got, I, John paid had, a, had his bike. He wanted to sell. So, I bought I bought her that bike. We fixed it all up, made it look like her, you know, put pink all over it. Anyway, she goes out there her first year, never been on a pro one bike, never shifted nothing, couldn't even drive a standard car. Okay. So I teach her how to shift the bike. We go out there her first year at the Toka. I won the Pro One Championship. She got second. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah. Her first year. Okay. Ooh. And this then also in 2021, I won the Mid-America uh Pro One uh, Quad Championship, and then uh, in twenty two we didn't race to, race too much. I kind of took the whole race three races the whole year, and that was it. And then twenty three, uh, we go back to Atoka, and of course you know I I I, I built Christy a, a, a Pro One car. I mean a top eliminated car because that's what she thought she had to have for twenty two. And she only, we we only raced three races, but she raced one, and y'all all seen the Willie she rode down the track in that. Anyway. Awesome. So, uh, 2023, we go back to the racetrack and, uh, the Toka, we're going to run the whole season and it come down to the final points race. And Christy won the points championship on the pro one quads. And I got sick. <laughs> Reversal. Yeah. So, I mean, that girl, she, you know, she don't get rattled. I mean, so, and, and you know, I guess when I was looking for, for next predict, potential wife, they had to like racing because it was going to be part of me, you know? Yeah. For so sure. anyway, that's kind of cool. And she was a natural after that. Yep. Yep. For after real. That she's uh she placed and won at Thunder Valley a couple times. Yep. And, yep. Uh, she's won a bunch of races. 
Yeah, and whenever uh whenever you guys race at Atoka, her name's always up there too. So right. Um so and we've and you, you talked you touched on top eliminator, top alcohol, pro one cars, pro one quads, pro two, pro three quads just <laughs> now. Um some of the cars that you owned and you know, just ran, running in those different types of classes. So um, the, what sorry, go ahead. uh what kind of preparation does it take for each of those classes and each of those vehicles? And uh, what is the prep? How differently is the preparation for each vehicle? Well, according to when I first started racing cars are now. <laughs> so some of the cars that I've raced, okay, uh, the first car that, that I raced was Tinker Core. I raced it for about, oh, six months one year. And I was like, man, I, I just I – just, thought I wanted to race cars and I kind of jumped out and I, and it set for a little while. And then, uh, I, I bought sticker shock, which was a little blown alcohol car. It was so, so was Tinker Core. He's a blown alcohol car too. Anyway. So then I raced sticker shock and then I bought blue dog. And so in top eliminator, I run blue dog. I run second chance at top eliminator. Matter of fact, I won. There's a deal right here behind me somewhere. Uh, I don't see it, but anyway, it's, it's probably on the other side. I won, a, I won an event in second chance. Uh, at a, at a toka in the top in the top uh in the top eliminator chat deal and then i in the top alcohol i've i've had uh i've had crude awakening i've won some events in it i've had uh, i won a, i mean i won a championship in it and i won a championship in, in uh, the army car the top alcohol car and then i've changed the top alcohol car over to uh to uh uh flying high okay and so anyway, now we're going to bring it out this year. It's going to be completely different. We've got a whole new, a whole new deal on the top alcohol. About to, I said I was done racing top alcohol. And then Wade Schultz says he's going to build a car. And that's the guy from from uh where's he from? He's from down there in uh El Paso, We've got top dog. He said he's running both events this year. And uh so then uh I'm hoping to get we can get uh, Morgan out of retirement, get him out here to race with us, you know. Mm -hmm. So we have a four car field, and that's pretty good for Oklahoma, you know, and, and maybe we can get them all at, at, at Thunder Valley too. Sure. I'm hoping. So anyway, uh, that's, I, I was like, well, crap, if that, all that's going to happen, I'm going to put this car back together. So I put the car back together and we did a bunch of welding working on the chassis. I was going to change chassis. I bought another chassis, but then I decided against it. And, uh, so, uh, everybody knows Kevin Quebec. He's going to come down and he's going to freaking do some, do some more welding on it. So, because oh, I, I I want that's my biggest concern about that car. The chassis is getting old. I think it was made built ninety two, and it's and, you know it's just I don't I don't want to uh, fold up a car. So anyway, he's going to come down and put some more braces in the chassis, and uh, we tuned the motor up. We built the motor where it's making a little bit more horsepower, and we put an automatic in. We put a two <laughs> we put a two speed uh, uh, four hundred a a, a a bad of the bone transmission in it, and so. I, 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 people, I mean, I, we'll see how it works. I think it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be, I, my, my, my deal is set the track record this year. At, at so, Atoka, which is Atoka's track record is tell everybody what it is for us. 259 please. with a nine. 259 with a nine. And I've run 261 with a six. And that was with the Chevy. And that, that was, was with, that was with crude awake. That was with the crude awakening car, which yeah. you bought from Pat Goodale from Michigan. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who holds the, the current team. record there? Uh, Mark Luce. Okay. Mark and Mark Luce. told me if I beat the track record, he's going to come back out. We'll see. <laughs> oh, then you definitely have to take that challenge. <laughs> yes, for sure. If Mark comes back out just to reclaim that track record, that'd be nuts. Uh, right. Or at least try to. 
But uh, you mentioned that flying high car earlier, which a lot of people may not know this. That used to be the U.S. Army car, correct? Correct. From correct. Uh, Michigan that you bought from Mr. Scott Shiat. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to this next question because you kind of yeah. uh, mentioned all the top alcohol, top luminary, and then you even mentioned the uh, four four car field for top alcohol would be right. amazing. Uh, not even just for Oklahoma, but anywhere in matter of fact. So could you just give us your opinion on the state of sand drags right now compared to when you first started in sand drags or even so winning when I first started sand drags, I'll never forget, you know, 2005, when we started, we started after the Memorial day race, we started the next month. So I didn't see that. And then the fall fest is never as big as Memorial day race. Because of Memorial Day race back then, the ASDA come out. So in 2006, my gosh, there were so many cars at Atoka that we was bunched in there in, in that track. It wasn't even hard to place to place to, to pit, okay? We literally had four feet of room on each side of the trailer to pit. And so the guys that had cars had a little bit more, but, you know, we had bikes, and that's all we got. Man, it was, it was crazy back then. So, you know, I seen it. And then when ASDA when, when ASDA quit, it kind of that the cars you know they didn't come to California no more, so that that, that part of the dip kind of slowed down. But you know, uh, I'd like to see the Mid American Sand Drag Series come back. I mean, I don't know how. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how how to make that happen, but I'd like to see that happen because when you had the when so so there's no way to have a points championship at at, at up there for top limber and top alcohol, really not a good. One. And same thing with uh, at Atoka, at Grain, at Grain Valley or Atoka. You kind of took that away when that when that left. It kind of it kind of quit. So, and I realize it's a lot of work, and I'm not willing to do it. <laughs> I'm just <you> know. <laughs> so <laughs> I know it's a lot of work, but you know, especially if we had a four car field of, of top top alcohol cars, because you know maybe if there was four cars in race, you know. Some people from California might come. Some people from Michigan might come, you know. Uh, and I know Jeff would be willing to add some money if there was at least four cars. There's there. also one more car that supposedly I heard just like in the grapevine that's supposed to be built out of Texas, top alcohol car. Another. Pat, is it Pat? No, no, no. No, Pat's, Pat's in, oh, Pat Ross. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's I don't know. The, I, I, they told me his name, but I'm not going to bring his name because I don't know the guy at all. Okay. I don't think I've ever even talked to him or met him. Okay. okay. So, uh, but I just heard that in the last 10 days that there was another guy building a top alcohol car. True or not, it was second hand, third hand, so I don't know. Uh, but that, now what was the question you asked me on the uh, state of sand drugs? Yeah. What were the, so, your comparisons to them from now to back then? Well, the competition is a lot, lot closer. You know, I think last year we probably averaged a 16 to 18 car field at a token Pro 1 cars every month. And I mean, <laughs> if you didn't run your number, you wasn't gonna you wasn't gonna win. And I mean, run your number, and you'd have to have a a, thir a, a a thirty or better reaction time to win. Hey, there is no slouches in that pro one field. In no, time. there's not. Now, something else that I that I started doing last year, I did it Thunder Valley, I did it in Atoka, and I'm gonna do it all year this year. <laughs> I'm running Blue Dog, which is which everybody knows what seen Blue Dog. I mean, it, it, I'm gonna run it Pro One, Pro Two, Pro One, Top Eliminator, and if uh, I've run it Top Alcohol twice, uh, and I, I ain't against that. Uh, I got I got a tune up for it, but I got my tune up this year way way easier. Before it's taking about 45 minutes to change from from Top Eliminator to Top Alcohol. Now it takes me less than 15 minutes to make the change. Cause I, I got, I learned a few things, but anyway, I mean, that'll, that, that'll car run pretty good. Even, even though it's a, a, a top eliminator car, I mean, it'll certainly, it'll certainly run a low seventies and, and some, and it's run, it, it's, it's run. It, I mean, I think 72, I run years ago at Kansas city when I ran, when I run John Morgan, and my back tires was in my front tires in there and he snuck underneath with his front tires and won the race because I couldn't get the car on the ground at the end of the track. But anyway, uh, that's the car's kind of short to be running top alcohol, but anyway, go ahead. That's a big, start. that's a big block with, uh, with a whipple, correct? The 540, uh, Merlin steel, steel block with a, with a, with a, Mer uh, with a, a whipple on top of it. Yes. That's insane. Wow. Yeah. That's go insane. ahead. 
That's insane. I was just saying that's insane. Um, I think John. I think John had a question about uh, yeah. something. Yeah, Randy, what's your favorite track outside of Oklahoma that you've been to? What What is your, you know, what's your favorite? Oh, here's what I say. I, I I've been to West Michigan twice or three times. I can't really remember the second. I like that track. I like the track that uh, in uh, Virginia. Can't think of the name of it at the moment, but we went Newtown. out there, huh? Newtown. Newtown. Yeah, that's a super nice track. Uh, but but bar none, if you if you go race at freaking Thunder Valley, you got to drive the car, okay? Yeah. And you got to be ready for that car to stand up. I mean, I hit the wall with crude weight because I stood it up and just went over and smacked the wall because, you know, and I let out of the dang thing and it jumped up and hit the wheel on it the second time. So, you know, I mean, it's just part of it. You, you have to drive at, a to at, at Grain Valley. I, I was on my Pro 1 quad. I'll never forget this. It was pretty funny because because Cecil was up there that weekend. I, I, I took off and that quad stood up on the back tires and started skating across and it hit that guardrail so hard it bent the outside of the rim. But that old guardrail, even over the quad, goes, bruh, 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 you just hear it just making all kinds of noise and it bounced me off of it. And I and I won the race and never let off the gas. And see, when I come back, he said, "Did you get that car around?" I said, "No." He said, "I know you did. I heard it." I said, "Yeah, I heard it too." So anyway, you know, because at home, Cecil disqualified. He's disqualified me for running over the cones and everything else. Oh, yeah. He bought this ball me one time for driving inside because I broke the wheel in that little bitty red bike, and, and I went around the cone, come back out, and still won and disqualified me. So I get it. But he wasn't the track. He went the, the, nobody at the track paid any attention, so I didn't get qualified. Did disqualified it at Kansas City that weekend. So <laughs> way it goes. <laughs> so do you do you have a place that you want to go to, Randy, that you haven't been to yet? That's on the radar. So two times I I planned on going to Dome, and I ain't went, I went ain't went there. I want to go to Dome. I want to go to California because you know what? Them cars run faster in California than they do here. Yeah. Okay. There's yeah. no doubt about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh. So, go in March. Well, I can't. I probably can't go in March. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm putting together Christy a new car right now. It, John, matter of fact, I'm not. John Tate is. We took that blow car out of her daddy issues car, that blown engine, and we put it in a buggy. So she's going to run that buggy this year, and we're going to turn it down to where it runs like three fifties or three forties, and we're going to let her run it and. and and pro one quads, let her get used to it. And then I, I, don't, I know this, if that girl gets used to that car, the guy's going to include me. He's going to have a hard time beating her. That girl, she doesn't get rattled. No matter what you do, she don't get rattled. She just goes up there and she does her thing and turn lane. She don't care what you're doing. And she's got more focus than anybody I've ever seen. It's just unbelievable. So I'm going to get her set up for that. Then when the top, when, when March or May comes around, she should be ready to go, go top eliminator in that bug. So, so, but when it comes to those tracks you want to go to, Dome for sure, and in California for sure, is there yeah. anything else on that bucket list? Like anything in Indiana, so, or Ohio? I maybe? mean, yeah, when are we going to see you make an appearance at an outlaw race? Yeah. So, that would be interesting. Right. I'm not against it. Matter of fact, Kevin, me and Kevin's been talking. He, he wants to go to, to a couple of those races this year. And I Great. told him, pick the race he wants to go, and I'll go. That's so, awesome. Yep. Uh, I mean, you can't can't inflict with the point series at a toga, you know. Right. And that was there's one that does. We talked about running. We talked about this year running the points the point series, but y'all's last race winds up on the race at the same race as the toga. So anyway, or it did last year. So I, and I didn't see the schedule this year. We we just things ain't things ain't worked out where he could go or I go this year. But right. we're gonna. I want to go to one one or maybe two this year. Okay. Uh, I think it. I think the third weekend in September is the outlaw finale in Indiana, okay. and then the last weekend in September is our big race, and then two weeks after that is Fall Fest. Okay. Well, maybe I can make that. One. Yeah. I want to get. I need. I need to get with him and figure it out so so we could we can both show up and uh, you know let's probably maybe maybe drag a few more people with us. Yeah. Shout out so to Kevin. Kevin. Kevin the Kevin. thing about it is, is I don't understand how do they have a TE class. Who the Outlaw series? The Outlaws, yes. Yeah, well, they call it King of the Outlaw, but yes, it's two ninety five. Okay, days. okay. And then they have a class that's faster than that. Run what you run, whatever. They have an alcohol class. No, 
Okay. No. No, okay. just TE. Okay. No, yeah, just top eliminator. But they do have a 350 index, a 40 index, and uh, they do a nickel nightmare bracket class. John, can you tell them what the nickel nightmare is? Well, they switched away from nickel nightmare. It used to be uh, dialed to the uh, hundredth type deal. Uh, they got rid of it. It was tracking times in the tower doing open sportsman now. Oh, okay. It, it was just a lot of tower work to keep that class going. Yeah, so it's just an open, so it's just open bracket basically. Yep, it's open bracket now. Gotcha. So it, as far as, as TE Randy, I mean they're they're pulling, you know, anywhere from 15, 16 to twenty five cars in that outlaw that, series. You know, that Michigan it's, outlaw, it's a hell of an event. That Michigan outlaw race they had twenty seven cars. Yes, in the top TE. limited class. Yeah, and TE alone. And then the that Mich the Indiana race that got rained out, they were prime for the same number at least 27 28 it was a little lower at that indiana but that weather oh. was on forecast for yeah. the week so a few did kind of bail at the end but there was still a good 16 plus there and showing yeah right. Kavik showed up so yeah 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 but that 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 uh outlaw finale is def is uh third weekend of september so something to definitely think about uh and we just talked a little bit about this season and stuff like that and uh you you definitely want to do some more traveling it sounds like but what is your goal for this coming 2024 season so my biggest goal is a track record at a token okay that's what i'm at all right i uh i figured out a lot of things on the sand how you know how to make the cars go fast uh and you know so i think i, I <laughs> if everybody disagree with me that's okay i think that automatic transmission is the key I even I even was going to put a lockup in it, but when I talked to all the training guys, the guys that build the transmissions, they're talking there's only one to 200 RPM difference with the lockup. And the lockup where it's going to help you is, is you know, is, is past, the, past the 300 feet on, you know, on the asphalt. It's not going to do you no good before that. But I was thinking that I could that I could drop it the, drop the in the lockup. I could, I could shift about, about 60 feet, I could, you know, from first to second. And then I could go and get into the third about 120 feet, but or get into the lockup. But they, every one of them said, I, I won't, I won't see no gains from that. So I'm going to go this year without the lockup and just, I got it, I got a two speed 400. I mean, it's a, it, it, it's, it'll be awesome. It's, and I'm going to, I'm going to put ripper tires on this car, which I've never run. I've always run super scoopers. So I got a set of ripper tires coming. So it's going to be, it's going to be a whole new ball game this year. And I think I'll be on the track record. That's so, awesome. We'll Man, see. That's going to be very the grid good. is the, is the, the main, the, the biggest thing that's happened over the, over the last few years, you know, the grid with the grid on them cars, it's just completely a new ball game. You can just tune a card about any track you go through and it's not hard. Right. So that's, that's my big goal. I, uh, I want I want to see I, my, I want to see my wife I want to see Christy win a top eliminator event, okay, and uh, so she cert she certainly is capable. She's not comfortable in the car yet. She wasn't comfortable in the dragster at all. So uh, a friend of mine had this. I, I I actually went to Las Vegas and bought this car, bought that that uh, buggy from Hickey uh, out there. So I think it's his name. And anyway, out in Las Vegas. I brought it back a couple of years ago, and then I sold it to uh, to uh, a guy down in Texas, uh, Patrick, Colin. and uh, he raced it last year in, in Pro One. And then he was wanting to sell it, so the last race of the year, I had Chris. I said, "Go over and sit down in that car." And she went over when she got it. She said, "This is my car." So I said, "Okay." So I bought it, and so we got it down at John Pace, and he's put he's putting that 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 small small block in it. Uh, so. I mean, it'll run the number. Uh, matter of fact, I was just looking out there at the number of a motor of a, of a dra the, the record with a dragster with a with a blown motor in it, and I believe I go to California, I set a record with that car. I mean, people may not believe me until I showed up. That car, will fly. that car run run an eighty an eighty seven at at uh, Kansas City with fourteen pounds of boost in. It. So, <laughs> which car was that? Which car is that? Uh, second chance run second run chance. that with that motor, okay? And that okay. was that motor. The you same bought that boat. car from John. Yes. What? You bought that second chance car from John. I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. yeah. And that track, that car, Anthony Moss owns that car now, and he's putting the motor and the transmission out of sticker shop over in it right now, and it's going to be running this year. Nice. Oh, so he's going yeah. to top eliminator or pro one? No. Well, I don't know. I keep, I, you know, 
he's 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 going pro one right now, you know. Uh, yeah. but anyway, he's putting that car back. It'll be back out there this year. He changed the name to something. He repowder coated it, changed the name so it ain't pink no more. But anyway, he didn't uh, like the pink, huh? No, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Uh, no big thing. So so it's coming back out, and I think his boy's going to try to put the motor together probably next week and put sticker shock back out there with a the, with a little uh, aspirated motor in it. Uh, and then I sometime this year I'm going to build another blown LS. I had that blown LS I ran last year and in Pro One a few races, but it was just too small for me. It had a 20 inch cage, and every time I get out of it, my elbows would be freaking bloody. <laughs> And I mean, even through a fire suit, it's just too small for me. And so I, uh, I'm going to take that that daddy issues car. The daddy issues car's got a 23 inch cage, and I'm going to I'm going to put a a blown a blown LS in it, okay. and uh, come back out and run Pro One next year again. Hell yeah! So that is, that's that's really cool. It sounds like you got some good goals for next year. You got a good uh, plan to it as well. Um, any goals for the the kiddos? So. We got them both. We got them both. A little little warriors. They're both going to run warriors, and, and, and one of them's going to run Pro Four. One of them's going to run P. Okay? okay, but so they're they're up, their bikes are already set up, ready to go. We'll see how they are. They getting out of the golf cart now. Yep, yep. <laughs> both going to be on warrior. <laughs> they want <laughs> that youngest one. Wants, I want to ride the side by side again. I said, no, we're going to ride this forward to so get used to it. You know, and then the older one, I think he's he's fixing. He may be already thirteen. He's like, well, can I ride your bike? I said, you're not ready for a pro one bike yet. <laughs> hey, he's so, hey, he's got he's got that feeling like his mom does, yeah, though. Yeah, you know, yeah, so he does. He may, he may be so, in a couple of years. He might be. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, the pro one bike. So anyway, I got I got a new pro one bike that's going to come out this year that I'll race on this year. So we'll see how all that goes. Oh, any yeah. details you can give us about that? Uh, so I, I'm I'm buying Tommy one of Tommy Springs bikes. Oh, you bought one of them. Yeah, well, I, I paid him some of it. I ain't paid him all. I got to go get it. I was going to go get it next weekend, but probably the next weekend after that before I go now. Got a bunch of crap come up next weekend. But, yeah, I'm going to go to Tennessee and pick it up pretty soon. So I have it. Uh, it'll be for the first race of March. I'll have it I'll have it at the racetrack. Well, that's awesome. We know we yeah. all know the kind of work that Tommy does on those bikes. Uh, he just does an awesome job on those bikes. He really does. Yeah. Uh, Randy, we really appreciated your time here today. Loved Thank having you. you on. Everything you had to say, we absolutely enjoyed it. Uh, we got one more thing for you. Actually, hopefully you got one more thing for us. We're going to ask you for your one thing, which is just a bit of news from what you're doing or a shout out to somebody you know or whatever the track's doing. Uh, your one thing is brought to you by SM Engineering, where you can design, build, and test. Sam McCray can hook you up. He's got float fuel systems, dyno testing, fuel management, tune-ups, consulting, race pack, and data acquisitions, wiring, mechanical services, that's SM Engineering Design Build Test, SM Engineering Uh, Randy, you got a one thing for us. So let me tell you what my shout out is. So when I when I, I you know, you give me a day's head up on the shout out. I really thought about that. There's a lot of people done a lot of stuff with this with the sand drag industry. But you know, if you look on this wall behind me, Lone Star Graphics has freaking been awesome. Okay. And they're about to the end. They're, you know, he he talks every year about retiring. And when he does, it's going to be a big old void. I don't know what we're going to do with that. Uh, I mean, they go all over the United States, all over the races. If it wasn't for them, my walls wouldn't look like this. And this ain't the only wall like that. The other walls are like that, too, you know. Uh, I have no idea how many races I've won, but I've won a bunch. And, you know, you got trophies from, from all the trophy classes and, and the, from the championships that I've won and at, at me at uh oh i think the only time i ever went to uh jeff's track down there in louisiana one of those big events was in 14 and uh you know i i, I got trophies from that from that weekend uh it's just awesome that what they do you know because you can win a trophy when i when i used to race on, on the when i used to race in the sprint cars and the street stocks i got trophies okay but those trophies long been thrown in the trash. There was a trophy that looked about like this. They freaking had a car on top of them. They said, you won this race. They didn't have your car, your bike, your whatever on them, okay? And they wasn't personalized like this. These will be on the wall till I die, you know? And matter of fact, I just, I, I've been talking about Lone Star, about making, remaking every one of my trophies so I can put my new race shop. I got a new race shop being built right now. <laughs> yeah, how cool would that be to have every trophy in one spot on one wall 
Okay. Way cool. I think so too. All yeah. right. And so, because I mean, all my trophies aren't even hung up in this office because there ain't enough room for them. There's a stacks of them in there, you know. And I'm like, and you know, I've, I've won I, 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 I've won trophies in West Michigan. I mean, it's it's just it's just really really cool. West Michigan does some things like they put out this one thing. It's got like whatever the track was. You won this event on a piece of uh, whole garage sale signs, what I want to call it, little white white board, and and, it, and you know, and it says how much you won on that race for the. For this muffler man race, I think's what it is. Anyway, them are kind of cool, I, and and I think uh, I, I I think them are cool because they're so big. They're, you know, they're they're big. And, and anyway, so there's just so much stuff out there that uh, that Lone Star Graphics has done. Now that what that that deal what Lone Star Graphics, but, but but they really they really been an inspiration to this sport. And so when you when my big shout out is people give them, give them some support. Because they do, they make these trophies for the track. They don't make nothing, okay? They're just giving a little bit of money. People need to buy from them and uh, so support the port. Because they're getting old. They don't want to move around so much. And we need them to go as long as they can. Yes, so sir. that's my big shout out. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, the next I, thing is, Billy Teeters, find somebody to get this Mid America Sand Drag series back going. <laughs> okay? Uh, we, because we, when that quit, the top alcohol quit. Okay. Well, well, we can talk about that. There's just, uh, well, there's, there's, <laughs> I didn't say you had to do it. I said find a way. Well, we, we'll talk about that later. But uh, I totally agree about uh, Gary and Michelle Burroughs with yep. Lone Star Graphics. I've known them ever since I was like five years old, and they've been doing it ever since I was a kid, like 25 years at least. Right. So they, they do amazing work everywhere they go. Yes, they they do. do. They do. They've been to Michigan. They've been, you know, they go to every race in Atoka. They come to two big races at Thunder Valley. They go to Louisiana. They uh, wanted to go to Arizona, but then they got in that unfortunate accident. But they've been everywhere. All the tracks that were open in Texas, um, they've been to Gravel Rama. They've been, uh, they they just been so many places. Shelton's, right. Little Sandy. Right. There's just there's so many places. And uh, yes, I totally agree with Randy. You can support them. You can buy their stuff online. LoneStarGraphics.info. Go check it out. And like literally all the pictures they've ever taken is right. on there. It's a great archive right. as well. Um, uh, man, that's a great one thing, Randy. It really is. Uh, real quick. I do have one more question for you. That plaque with a picture of the blower car right next to you. Hey, what car is that? This? Yes. That is, uh, the, uh, the blue dog. Can and we that see it? is Heartland Nationals of 2017, the first place. Can we see it? Can we see yeah. it up close? Yeah. Can you see it there? Tilt it yeah. down a little bit. There you go. There you go. Down. There, much better. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah, and that is the famous blue dog. And you that bought that car my... from Michigan too, right? Yes, I bought that car from Dave Billings. Uh, I bought like four four race cars and uh, two quads out of out of uh, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, Michigan, Michigan's your go to is your marketplace yep. for Sandra. And for it? sure, blue dog's the favorite the favorite car I've ever owned. You know, especially with that top alcohol tune in, you get out there and you fly down the track. It's it's a ton of fun because it's going to be on the back wheels. Well, it always is. It always there's more pictures of it with the wheels up than the wheels down. Right. That's for sure. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. Randy, we really appreciate your time, man. Thank you once again. Okay. Thank My you. My secret to the first to all the the picture with the wheels up when I go to a track, especially when the, if I go to any anywhere I go, the first pass, I'm gonna put the wheelie bar upside down and make it pass. <laughs> all right y'all take care thanks randy yep all right hope you guys enjoyed that uh little interview we have with randy kimbley uh john sorg and uh, billy teeters there uh next we're talking about something kind of interesting this is uh from news from kill care uh raceway xenia ohio they are going to be the first facility in drag racing to implement a shot clock. So what they're uh, what they're talking about doing is uh, moving to a 60 second time to be able to complete your burnout stage and have the tree drop. If you take longer than the 60 seconds, they're going to drop the tree and one or both competitors are going to be disqualified. They're doing that to kind of help the show uh, kind of move forward. Obviously, a lot of these big pavement races, they're they're getting quite a few entries, 
And I know Isaac is uh, very keen on talking about this uh, when we all all saw we all shared it um, in our group chat. So, hey. I mean, it, it's the first first time I've ever heard of it. Uh, they're billing it as the first promoter to ever do it. But um, I think it's a really interesting concept. I don't know. I think it would work in the sand as well with some tweaks. I mean, I don't know if 60 seconds is quite enough time. But, man, I mean, you talk about either people getting with the program or going out rounds, uh, you're going to have to figure it out pretty quick. If you're a guy that takes a long time to stage, this is not going to be good news for you, I feel. You know, um, interesting. More interesting, I guess, than anything else. Um, really would be interested to see how it would do. I mean, because let's face it, we've all – everybody on the panel has been to a race that's supposed to get done Saturday night and the next thing you know, <laughs> you're you're one of two things. You're either racing at three o'clock in the morning, or it's gates open at nine o'clock tomorrow morning, and racing's going to start at ten. You know, type. Oh, of hey, deal. look, there's the so, sun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I mean, I I'd like to see it in practice and maybe hear some feedback, you know, from some of the asphalt guys how they feel about it. But I tell you what, if they can make it work, wow. I mean. Just the cars and the passes, you could put down a track with something like that going. Now, obviously, oh, yeah. you've got, you know, you know, with our sport, you have some track prep and stuff like that. That's got to happen in there that would reset the clock and that sort of thing. But at the same point in time, when you really think about it, though, if you skip the burnout and you've got 60 seconds to stage – from and you have things properly ready, like that next pair is starting to come out of the lanes as that first pair goes through the um, through the finish line lights. You think about it, sixty seconds is actually a fair amount of time to roll in there, get yourself into the beams. I I oh, yeah. feel. I mean, now I, I agree. mean, obviously, you know, guys, you know, top eliminator you know, top alcohol, some of those classes. Okay. We're talking very different, you know, type of thing. I'm just talking regular bracket classes. I feel like it's, it may not be as short a time as what we think it is. I don't, well, know, I don't, I don't agree with that. Hold on. I don't know how many tracks have that issue really. Cause I can personally speak for Thunder Valley. <clears throat> the only reason we don't hurry up and send the top eliminator cars, like we would the bracket cars or the bikes like that is because, Sometimes those alcohol cars will just not turn all the way off the track at Thunder Valley before they shut off. So they're just sitting in the middle of the shutdown turned off. So then they got to get hooked up to their tow back and then pulled out of the way before we can start the next pair. And that's the only reason why I can't think of making. Well, and I will say too, fly. Billy, that, um, this promoter here, they're, they're talking about if there's some sort of breakage or something goes like that, the shot clock does get paused and if there is some sort of breakdown at the line they're talking about pausing it uh, starting it up with 30 seconds mm -hmm. so i i would imagine there would you know especially for a sand as isaac saying there would have to be some changes mm -hmm. i know that some tracks too also have like a you know some people send a pair straight from the state some of them have kind of more of a hot box where they're they're already sending the next pair out ready to go you know that's what you're saying like some tracks don't really have that problem I would say that this this comes down to a lot um, the big cars, how long they take to actually fire up. I don't think it's necessarily how long they take to stage. I think once they get rolling, they're pretty good. But sometimes it takes them a minute, and also bikes. You know, I'm the the bike guy on the panel this week, so there's definitely some bike teams that they they take a long time to go and stage. And that's really all this is about when you talk about the sand drag aspect mm -hmm. of it. I mean, I know the top eliminator guys, top alcoholists, you know, kind of like I said, but really, I mean, unless for the top eliminator, top alcohol guys, unless something breaks and they have to, they can't turn all the way off the track yet. You're not, you can do, you can totally do that 60 second shot clock with them. Um, definitely. It, for sure. It's definitely, it's definitely about the bikes. The PSDA stuff, <laughs> and you know, and, and when Ricky was here last week, he kind of he kind of touched on it a little bit. But yeah, I mean, when we no, talk and, about and this... the last the last Gilbert <clears throat> race, they they didn't a hard shot clock on there, but they did talk to people, and 
make sure the people were were going and, and hurrying up a little bit more just because they had such a big turnout. They're running into that same issue that a lot of the pavement tracks are running into with, hey, we got to get the program done. And, you know, we don't they don't like to go race on Sunday like, you know, Isaac's talking about. They want to get that stuff done Saturday. So, you know, I, I think some version of this can be beneficial to the, the sand side. But, you know, it's it's I, I think maybe a minute might be too um, little t- for some people. Um, but I mean, certainly I can't imagine more than two minutes being necessary from the, the moment you start up to the moment that the tree drops. It'd be interesting to time it now that we talk about it because I never really thought about it before, you know. We talk about the ATV guys and stuff, but then you got the car guys too. I think a lot of it's going to have to do. I think a lot of it's going to have to do track personnel, and what I mean by that is, yeah, if we don't have enough track personnel, you're not going to be able to get the guys in that class A, if you will, to be up at the staging to be ready to go into what you know, yeah. into the light or into the bleach box on the blacktop. It's going to have a yeah. lot to do with the track and having that together too i think once that's together to work but kill care i've raced there many years and uh, my kids my dad myself and the way that track set up and uh it, and damien I'm, I'm sure you've probably been there the way that's up when you pull up you're kind of you're directly left of the track and some of the guys you know it's very short where the bleach box is and, and i don't know if they'll have enough room there to I don't know if they have enough room to pull up and have somebody in the bleach box waiting or not. I don't know. I guess they do now, but years ago, there wasn't enough room really to do that. Well, I think the burnout itself, once you pull to the bleach box or through it, is when they're putting the shot clock. Yeah, or just before. They're talking talking whole burnout procedure. Um, Yeah. It's short enough, Caleb, that a dragster, if you're in that lane, a dragster, you've got to – it's it's tight. Oh, yeah, it it's a tight corner. I, I, I get that. And I would say um, you're saying with track staff, too. I think the other component of this is that if you're going to have a shot clock, you, your starter has to be religious on 60 Absolutely. seconds or whatever the yep. time is, because that is something where if things go wrong and that tree drops before your stage. You're going to end up with a lot of upset racers. And we'll see what what that you know event is going to be like. And it takes some getting used to. And. I will say one thing that I would be disappointed with this is uh, you're going to lose staging duels. And I'm That's a sucker a for a thing. good staging duel. Oh, hell yes. Well, I, I think from the people I've talked to in the world since this come out, the guy, my buddies that you know that race up there still to this day, they really feel that from a lot of it's got to do with spectators. And what I mean by that is if the track can't have spectators, whether it's blacktop or sand, and part of the reason is because they're just sitting there with nothing to do. They're going home. If you keep it going, you know, that might be, 100%. they're thinking that might be part of the reason why they're doing that. And and sand is definitely a lot more guilty of that than pavement is uh, at any right. level of facility. Right. You know, sand, we, we tend to do the hurry up and wait a lot more than pavement does. Yes. Very much so. What's, what's interesting is he's actually, he's actually asking the racers to kind of step up. And coming from the other side as helping promote races and run races, waiting for the cars to get up there, you know, for people to be paying attention and get up there as part of it. But, you know, once they get down there and getting them in, usually not too bad. Feels but there like are a few eternity. that abuse it. Feels like What's an that? eternity. When you're working the staging lanes and you call people up, it feels like an eternity. Yes, like absolutely it does. Like you're stomping two, your feet. Two minutes feels like 10 hours. Just waiting for cars and yeah. bikes fill up the staging lane. You're just like pacing back and forth. Yeah. Now you got John seen this because he's been here. Brookville, you don't have to worry about them calling classes to the lanes, especially on a normal bracket night, because we legitimately fight over the front row at the tracks sometimes. Right. It's because of the way they do the track here. There's so many fast cars anymore. And there's so many slow trucks all in the same class and they want something completely different. And you'll see all the alders, all the dragsters rush to get in line and they haven't even told us which class is running first. Well, I think another thing is too, I don't know what you guys think, but another thing is I think it depends on the track as in what they normally do. Silverback, you know, when you go there, you 
kind of better have your stuff together and be ready to go. There's other tracks that it's just kind of lollydag, you know, whatever, you know, we're going to race and there's no super rush, you know, and I think that's another problem too. You got some tracks that are, Hey, we're going to roll, we're going to roll. And you got others that are mellow pace, you know? So I think a lot of it's going to have to do with the track myself. Agreed. Oh, totally. Well, what I was going to say is that, um, fudge. I, what you were going to say was. <laughs> I, I told you guys earlier, he's been short circuiting. I can see I the had, smoke. <laughs> I had it and I lost it. I can tell you well, what here, you I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask you guys this. Um, if we were to implement a shot clock, what do you think is the ideal amount of time? And we'll, we'll say from the moment a starter says to pull out from the lanes, start your crap, pull out from the lanes till the tree drops. What do you think is the optimal amount of time? We'll start Real with quick, Isaac's, uh, I think a shot clock really would work better for those that are not up there. Instead of the starter guy or the track guy, the promoter standing there going, they're on the announcement, they're saying, hey, Joe Bob, you got two minutes to get here. Nobody really knows if they're really watching that or not, but if there's a shot clock there and that dude ain't there, everybody can see it. It might be better to look at that in the sand drag side of, you know, hey, well, like, if you've been called, yeah. you're not up here. You only got there's, so much time. There's some that already have it. like a, a two or three minute warning for people like that. Right. But what so, I'm saying is nobody knows. Nobody can see if they sure. actually have a clock. You'll be able to actually the other driver racer can see it. And be like, hey, this dude ain't here yet. And not, now, well, it took longer than two minutes. And it must be because it's his buddy. You know what I mean? Because I've heard that said before. Uh, well. <laughs> John, you had something to say? No, I'm good. Oh, I'm Cody? just listening up here right now. Damien? Now, with what Dave is saying there, and this is generally what we do here with the Outlaw Series, Brookville, Cleves. Um, we do it when we go up to Michigan, when they do their four-lane chip draw up there. You have till that by run pulls to the lane. They draw by run at the start of the class, whether it be by computer or in Michigan. They draw lane four, four cars back, he gets the buy. And they set aside to the end of the class, whether they have to run the, if it's an even number of cars in the class still or an odd number. Once that buy run has pulled to the beams to stage and make their pass, the class is over. You have till there to get your ass in line, staged up, ready to go to where when they pull your chip on, on the chip draw, okay, you're racing so and so. Isaac, what do you think, Bob? I would, 90 seconds comes to mind. I think a minute and a half is is more than enough time when the starter points to you and says, you know, picks a pair and brings you both out at that point. I think 90 seconds, you both should be able to be in the beams at that point. That's need, actually a pretty long time. Do you, you think you need 30 more seconds, though, than a guy that had to do a burnout? I think 60 is pretty good. I, I went with 90 just from the idea that way if somebody – if somebody's kicking a bike or something, they're trying to get the thing started, or that's something, you know, they can 90 seconds, that's a minute and a half. Say somebody's bike doesn't start on the first kick or something like that, it gives them a little bit of a fudge factor to get in there. It's always a bike thing. <laughs> yeah. So when do you got 90? Damien, what do you think? What do you think for your time? I personally, I'm not really a fan of it in the way of, like you said earlier, I'm a fan of the old staging duels. I've sat there. Especially with our Jeep, I've watched my dad multiple times. Someone in staging, oh, I have to stage last. And my dad will go up there and sit for two, three minutes waiting for the other guy to stage. And it's some of them, for me, it's entertainment. Sure. But if you had, if we were forced to go if, to a shot clock and you had your pick of time, what, what I would, would say, what would say 60, ideal time? 60 to 90 seconds would be more than enough for most tracks okay. because that would actually make people think about. Oh, hey, because as we've discussed in previous episodes with a lot of car guys, and John's driven a truck that's guilty of this, pull up about 10 feet from the start line, put it in neutral, wing it to the moon four or five times, and then pull it into stage. When will the certainly, shot? That certainly doesn't take that much time, though. Four or five quick whaps. Uh, I've seen them take, I've seen some people take longer than that truck, but. Oh, I thought you meant when I was driving. No, ah. not you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Cody, you got anything? Saying, I think 90 seconds would be perfect for sand drags. That thinking, I'm trying to think of like some tracks that have like pretty decent length of uh, distance from their staging area to like the lights. Like Atoka, for example, for anybody who's been there where the, the cars are staged, 
it's a decent little jog to get up to the lanes. So yeah. like kind of keeping tracks like that in mind, I think 90 would be perfect. So Thanks. when does the shot clock start according to this promoter? When is it as soon as the, the tree drops or is it as soon as the racers it said the are past line. the finish line and, and safe? It said when they get to the finish line. You would think once they're clear from the track, you know, officially off the track, then you would start to stop clock. I would be my starting point if I had to pick one. For sand, I would say it comes down to when the starter. So when, like Michigan, they have their light on the tree. Cleves has their light on the tree. Brookville has their light on the tower that I keep an eye on. And then the starter, once that light's yeah. on – the starter waves you into the beams it's on you to get there in the time my thing is too real quick guys blacktop wise depending on the vehicle if it's bracket racing you know nhra rules typically as any other track you go to is you cannot cross the beam during a burnout but if you've got a dragster or an altered that has no front brakes and they do a burnout and they roll past the, the beam you ain't gonna be able to do that in 60 seconds in a way, yeah, because they got to go down, stop, back up, pull back forward. So, I guess it's maybe more geared towards their bracket racing, possibly. Sounds it's like definitely it. what it is because Hill Care still has a very large bracket race. I believe Estes Oil Company, Kelly Estes, who is a former sand drag racer as well, he puts on a very big money bracket race at Kill Care, I believe, and they'll get four or five hundred entries. Well, I want to see. I want to see the people that's listening. Give us some feedback. Jump on there. Let's hear some of your guys' thoughts and put you know, put it on a message oh, yeah. on YouTube. Message us, whatever. Yeah, Let's YouTube. get your all thoughts on this. Share this. Uh, will, uh, subscribe to us. I will <laughs> say that my my pick. I'm going to go with Isaac's 90 seconds. I think that that you know, from the point where you're told to go and pull out, um, I think 90 seconds is a pretty good amount of time, even for those those longer distance tracks like. Uh, Cody's talking about Atoka. Um, it's definitely one of them. Avenal here in the West Coast. So there's a good distance from front of the staging lanes or the hot box area to those uh, staging beams. But I think 90 seconds is a pretty good amount of time. That's a good when, topic. Caleb, when we did Prim, the target was 45 seconds from when the pair prior cleared the finish line to the next pair was rolling into the beams. And then and you know, deal. I think Prim was pretty pretty well run with that. Um, not for the big cars, obviously. A lot of them, you know, especially the right. fuel cars. Oh pretty, yeah, pull, pulling them out onto the track and stuff, which you know everybody did like. You know that kind of startup procedure that definitely took longer. But the bracket classes, yeah, I, I would say between forty five, I would say minute max was usually where where they were at. Yeah, so. and I don't know how other tracks are ran, but last year when I was working in the staging lanes at Thunder Valley, and we had our um, safety guy James working the lights. He would flip the switch, and when the lights drop, uh, as soon as the pair that was on the track hit the finish line, I'm sending the next pair up to go into the lanes. And I mean, even if anything were to happen with the pair in front of us that just hit the finish line, if somebody was stuck on the track, James had the power to turn on our hazard lights, and then he would hop on his quad or whatever and go down there if he had to or most of the time the bike would just shift back into second gear and just move on its own and um or a car would just have to like restart and shift back down in the first and move out of the way so uh so billy what, what do you think is your optimal time for a sand drag shot clock after isaac said 45 seconds i like 45 seconds 45 <laughs> to 60 quicker seconds. than the pavement huh i mean you're going with john's theory hey you don't gotta do a burnout you don't. Yeah, I, that's I what mean, I'm thinking. Did, when I mean, I was a little pushy when I was running the lanes at Thunder Valley last year, and you know, I mean, I need to be a little more lenient when we get down to the finals and people need cool down time and all that. But I mean, you should always try to get the classes with the most entries done quick. You know, like you want the you want the big rounds to be finish quick like if you got 64 entries you want to get that 64 down to 32 as quick as possible and then you and it does keep your spectators there yeah and you yeah. want that you want that 32 down to 16 as soon as possible as well and you know at thunder valley we're pretty good at like you know in sport atv if we got 
30 entries and we only got, you know, unfortunately eight cars in our trophy class, then we'll run two rounds of Sport ATV until we get lined up to the cars and then we can go back and forth until we're done. So there you go. Well, but, I mean, you know, we're good. 40, 45 to 60 seconds is good. Uh, hold on, Dave. Cody, what did you say? Oh, I was just going to say this guy had me like on a freaking respirator because I had to talk so dang fast because he was sending him down there so darn fast. This person dial in this time. Okay, go. This person dial in this time. Okay, go. So I think another thing that might help us in the sand drag part of it is I'm sure all of us have seen this. You're watching, you see the guys coming up. And their helmets off, whatever. And then right, the other the people in front of them, they go down to the racetrack, and then they start putting their helmets on. And I've seen that happen a lot. It's like they should be ready, if, you know. So you got a pair in the lights, and you got a pair. We'll just say um, the bleach box. We'll just call it that. Those ones that's in that bleach box should be ready to go. They should be yeah. helmets on, seat belted in, ready to rock. If it's a bike, obviously they may not be running, but. And then the guys behind them, as soon as they pull up, they should start getting their stuff on. And I see that more than anything that slows oh, yeah, things down. Trust me, guys and that's not not this, that is for sure the biggest thing that I see out here in the West. It's the next pair. The guy's not in the vehicle, doesn't have his nope. helmet on, seatbelts aren't strapped in. He's putting on the fire suit last minute. You know, yep. like you, you definitely have to be ready to go, if, especially if you're in the next pair up. Yes, for sure. All right. All right, guys, we're going to move on to our one thing here. Our one thing is brought to you by SM Engineering, SM Engineering, design, build, test, float fuel systems, dyno testing, fuel management, tune-ups, consulting, race pack, data acquisitions, wiring, and mechanical services, SM Engineering, design, build, test, smengineeringllc.com, smengineeringllc.com, 740-361-069. Hit up Sam McRae. He'll get you right. SM Engineering, design, build, test. Um, Damien, go first and make it a little quick. <laughs> Come back around to me. I gotta think on this. All I got right, a good one here. So I just sent in uh, to the group chat. So I'm a little early on this, but you know we're getting into PSDA week pretty soon here at Dome Valley Raceway. Um, I'm very excited for that race. I'm looking forward to debuting the weight class. I'm hoping that uh, some gear changing uh, that we're going to be doing and some stuff with the clutch is going to Get a little bit of ET. I just showed you guys a picture of my new seat. My old seat freaking bruised my tailbone, so I'm looking to have a little bit of comfort. Hopefully, gonna <laughs> get a chance. Uh, my dad's gonna take uh, the Good bike year. over to a buddies of ours to, to weigh the bike. We don't really know what it weighs yet, and uh, that'll determine whether I have uh, Isaac's steak dinner or I have to start photosynthesizing <laughs> before that, that race. <laughs> Nice. All right. Well, good luck with that. I hope all is well with the weight class bike. Uh, weight class is badass to watch. So good luck with that. Um, Dave, what is your one thing? All right. So uh, I guess for this year, we've been, what, the last two years trying to get my stock X3 in the three second range. We were so close for the 404. Found an issue with it here at the end of the year. Uh, the exhaust valve springs were shot. So it's got a new Whalen V1 head on it and uh, done a little test hitting here a couple weeks ago. I think we're going to see some threes. I think she's going to make Ooh. a 390 pass. Right. I, I, I'm pretty confident of it. Uh, go. Real happy about that. And I got to give thanks to Whalen Speed, Angel Performance. Uh, you know, Whalen takes care of all the tuning. Angel, he's uh, Lonnie Angel. He takes care of my clutching for me. I got EFG Stump Grinding. That's my buddy KD. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be where I'm at for sure. Murray Power nice. Sports, man, Murray, Murray's been there. They're awesome. Those are the guys that are really standing behind me, and I greatly appreciate it. And, you know, fingers crossed we get them threes here in two weeks. Two weeks we should know. Mm-hmm. And that's not one got, thing. Damien, you got one thing. Get down to that 4-0 territory, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Damien, you, know. you got your one thing? I'd have to say right now, mainly our big thing this year is we're trying to upgrade it here and there, change of gears maybe. Um, we're looking at rebuilding our old 4.8. We ran at Gravel Rama this year. We tried to melt it down. Well, I tried to melt it down. I put, didn't pull enough timing, spraying a ton of nitrous to it. But we're really happy with what we've seen with what we learned with it this year. Um, we might be doing a couple of mud races here or there for down in Kentucky where they do the um, Texas Mud Drag Series that's coming up. They're going to 
Missouri and all over the place. It was a real big hit last year, and they've got a few classes that we might fall in, so we'll see what happens throughout the year. Cool. All right. John Sawyer, you got one thing? Sure. I guess I'll start. I'm going to use mine for a shout-out. i got to give a shout-out to uh, Jim Bailey, Dean Dangerman, Dylan Lemke, Performance Transmissions out of Mears, Michigan, Brian Jones. Uh, these guys helped me bring home the hardware this year, so uh, how could I not give what them is, a shout-out? What is that from? Silverback Off-Road Speedway. Oh, they gave out belts this year, huh? That's yeah. Amazing. Points championship. Cody, you Over got there one looking thing? like a WWE wrestler. <laughs> Looks like Hornswoggle. Hey, Cody, you got <laughs> one thing? Yeah. Um, I don't want to go into a deep dive with my last one, but kind of. Um, I'm doing a little bit of a disagreement with Dave, what he was kind of talking about earlier. Maybe not quite a disagreement. Uh, so for those who don't know, I was race coordinator slash tower help for the last five years at Thunder Valley Zandrags. It was a lot of fun first few years. It turned into a more of a chore the last couple of years. So I kind of want to use my one thing to preach. Take this time, or uh, sand drag tracks. Uh, I think they should try to just make events more fun. Do a lot less rushing. That's just, you know, my opinion after living through it. With, um, sorry, I'm kind of going blank here. O- overall morale, I guess. Um, people don't, sand drag is like more of a hobby sport, I think. I know there's people that spend a lot of money on these fast cars. I know there's been sand drag associations. I know there's zero point series is trying to get, you know, on, you know, going overall, I see it as a family sport, a fun sport. You're not going to make any money doing it like you would going on your asphalt. So I say track should like maybe dial it back a little bit, have some more fun. Uh, track staff doesn't need to be feeling like they're working. In my opinion, it is work, but it should be fun. So that's my one thing. I kind of feel that. All right. Uh, Isaac, what is your one thing? For this week, I'm going to go with my one thing, keep it balanced. Um, You know, I date night with my wife tonight. um, And, uh, you know, this off season, I try to make it a priority to try to keep it balanced. Um, You know, knowing she's going to have a lot to put up with come the summertime and racing time and everything else. So, that would be my one thing to everybody, um, not only us on the panel, but if you're watching or listening to this, um, you know, find that balance because, uh, hey, man, we all know it's way better, um, you know, hanging out with your friends and everything else. You got people around to do it. Uh, so maybe find a little balance this winter and, uh, yeah, you know, keep the big picture in sight. There you go. Mama ain't happy. Ain't nobody happy, right? There you That's go. What they That's, That's a good one. <laughs> Great one thing. My one thing is uh, we keep getting Britton Whitney keeps messaging, commenting on the uh, YouTube and uh, sometimes my Facebook posts, and he's like, "Say something about Oregon." So uh, Oregon. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say something about Oregon. Albany is in the state of Oregon. I'll talk a little bit about Oregon since I'm, I have I, not I, been there for a car leave race. It at that. You didn't have to. <laughs> I was just trying to, be, a cool track. You guys I was go trying to be funny with it. And then you were like, let me expand. I was like, damn it. I know. What I know, what I know, what I know about Albany is that, um, um, they used to have a lot of fast cars. there. cars that have ran two fifties have been there. Um, they do have fast bikes that go there. Um, they still have a lot of cars can, running three O's and two nines there. Right. You can run a number at Albany shot. The Chris Wells. Shout out to Fort, uh, Brady, well, still Brady Mensenberg, fast Cam- naturally aspirated car in the sand, 3008. Yeah. McAllister, too. Shout oh, out, yeah. man. 335. Yeah. Pro Mod best guys in Oregon. Uh, shout out Bob Signs. I don't know if he, no, he's Washington, but uh, Bob helped us out in the early stages of WSDN. So uh, shout out Bob, no matter what. Um, but yeah, Albany is cool track. I would like to go there. I know Kayla's been there plenty of times, but I would like. I to want to go, go there myself. for a car race. I keep going just for yeah. the Pacific Northwest shootout. I want to go there for a car race. So, <laughs> yeah. sponsor us. We'll make it yes. happen. We want to go. Oh. Help us go. It would be sweet. So that's going to wrap it up for this episode of Paddle Talk. On behalf of Caleb Mings, John Sorg, Dave Applegate, Damian Bowers, Isaac DeHaan, and Cody Teeters, I am Billy Teeters, and we will see you next week. Thanks for watching. A little bit.